So, so yeah. So we're just talking about how how well, yeah political correctness makes it can make it difficult to have a conversation because we end up having to filter things right in ways that they didn't actually happen, but it kind of kills the vibe a little bit. So um, we do, I, I I vote we just keep it real. Yeah, which we'll, I mean we've been doing, but um we have. So the the probably one of the most <laughs> politically incorrect um, uh, characters that we ever ran into was was a wrestling coach along the way. So. Uh, <laughs> We can't, we're kind of jumping around timelines a little bit, but it's, you know, in the little break that we're just having, we're chatting about how there's a lot of people that have come up in the journey that have been really, they they might not be obvious to the scene, but they've been really important to us or they've gone on to do some some pretty significant things. Um, there's a number of people that have got their own gyms now uh, and, you know, various other things that are happening. But uh, when we're at Swan Street 211A uh, in the sweat box, one of the first kind of <laughs> things that we did, we did, like I realized somewhere early on, you already knew how to wrestle a little bit, um, and I realized I needed to work on my wrestling, and I started going out to um, Sam Parker's freestyle wrestling gym in Footscray. Um, yeah, what a guy! Sam's a unique character. What a um, guy! And uh, Sam, so yeah, the way that I describe him, and for those of you ha- who have seen it, most of you won't because you're too young because you, you guys are all kids. But for anyone that's kind of you know our age. If anyone's seen any, uh, everyone loves Raymond. The dad, like Frank. Frank, uh, what's his name? Uh, what's the the surname? Yeah, I don't, that's a good point. I don't know what the surname is, but that or yeah, what you're saying, like the coach off Frank uh, Barone. Yeah. Frank Barone, the coach off uh, off Rocky. Like it's just that. He was, like, he, was, he was Mickey from Rocky One, yeah. but bigger and angrier, and looked like the guy from Everyone Loves Raymond. And, yeah. and with a mix in from, um, I think it was his name was Rip Torn out of Dodgeball. You can dodge yeah. a wrench, you can dodge a ball. Yes, <laughs> it, like like it was. It was like put all that together, <laughs> and you got Sam with years of just general just anger <laughs> and just. Yeah, and like he had a bunch of yeah. reasons that he was angry, but whatever. So <laughs> I've ended up going out to Footscray to train freestyle wrestling because I realized, man, I got to, which might sound ironic because everyone considers me to be a guard player and I don't do takedowns. Um, I just keep them in my back pockets when I desperately need them. <laughs> uh, but uh, the reality, man, the wrestling's hard. Taking people down is hard work. Wrestling is so much easier to sit on your butt. And, and I've trained with some, I, I wouldn't say I was great at any of the combat sports that I've participated in. But by far the hardest form of competition that I had and, and training that I had ever participated in was wrestling. Yeah, it's tough, man. Physically, it's harder than jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu, it's, it's, it's much easier to just go towards your biases. But the pace is completely different as well. Yeah, 100%. Oh, it's and, super and intense. On, in, in Sam's wrestling room, you were not friends. No. <laughs> I even had one of the guys, he sort of took me under his wing a little bit. Uh, when I was there, he was, you know, we were sort of joking around before training and all that sort of stuff. We got on the mat and I and I was still the same sort of playful way like we would be in jujitsu. And he goes, no, dude, you don't get it. Now we're not friends. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, we're not friends. Yeah. And that's sort of how it was. I think there's an element in freestyle wrestling that's a little bit similar to striking where because the pace is so high... Yes, there's, there's there's styles of wrestling that can can be tied to their geographic locations. Yes. So the American style is different to the European style, and then there's varieties within Europe. But it tends to be much more aggressive than jiu jitsu. Oh yeah. oh yeah, by its nature, you have to you have to. Really well, that's that's also a consequence of the rules of play as well. Exactly, you have got short periods when you get penalised for for inactivity much more. You can't stuff. take a step backwards. You you stuff. have to push. Yeah, which is great. Um, but realizing that that pretty early on. We need to have some wrestling. So going out to to Sam's at Footscray, and get, get yelled at for two hours. Yeah, it's and which was Sam is is absolutely a character, and he and he hated jiu-jitsu. At least that's the way it seemed. Oh no, I oh, know he, he probably hated he it. hated it. I'm yeah. trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. Nah, um, no, no, but uh, but no, no benefit required. <laughs> but when I went out there and, and was training, so I was training out there. Like I was trying to go out there most Fridays because that was the um, that was really the only day I could get out there because we had classes Monday to Thursday and we had Saturday open mat. Yeah. Um, but training out training out there on the on the Fridays and it was great training. Uh, but I mean, I remember I was I was training with I was either Billy or Ali. I can't remember which. 
He's both the brothers that trained or, there. Or, or both Billy and Ali were they're beasts. Yeah, they were the top. They I, were the top I, guys. I, I trained with Ali. He, he, he yeah. was a smaller guy than me, and he, he whooped my ass. So the top three guys out there were Talgett, Billy, and Ali, and that's yeah. that's where I first met Talgett. And um, and then I was like, oh, hang on, I'm coming out here all the time. I could just get Talgett to come in and teach a free well, freestyle Tal- wrestling class. Talgett came over as the package. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and he happened to land there because Sam was tied up with the whole Olympic thing and yeah, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah, it was very much. But man, I was I can't remember. You know, so we do the freestyle wrestling warm ups, so we do all the stuff, and and then we'd start you know training and doing rounds. And like some of it was like our version of like hole drill or situational sparring or whatever you want yeah. to call it. And then you'd have your actual full wrestling rounds. Um, but during some of the rounds, Sam's yelling at me from the sidelines. He's like, "Stop doing that fucking jujitsu shit." Like just, just a like what just, are you? Yeah, what, what are, are you? Are you? Yeah, what are you a fucking pansy? What are you fucking doing? You look like a fucking girl. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> it's exactly. I, it. I remember. I think we might have been living together at the time. Murphy Street. Yeah, and you'd come back and tell me these stories. You should come. I'm like, fuck that. It was. It was. <laughs> like, but no. the thing is, they got saying before that if you if you knew what it was, you just kind of laugh it yeah, off. So yeah, I never yeah. took you it personally. You you didn't take it personally. He was there not to create better people. No. He had no <laughs> interest in that. No. It was, I, if you're going to be in this room, you are going to be a wrestler and you're going to fucking win. And that's how he was. Yep. And just, just I, I remember I, I asked him a question. I'm having a, like a jujitsu guy would ask it. I'm having a hard time finishing the double when the guy does this. And it was quite specific. Mm-hmm. What the fuck's wrong with you? Get out there and use your power, son. <laughs> right, and he just sit there on his chair, sort of hunched over, you know. He's like, ground control to Major Tom. Just use your power. <laughs> you know, you just be... And I'm just like, okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm doing... I'm training with Billy LA. I can't remember who it is. And uh, Sam's starting to get frustrated at me because... Uh, you know, which, like, which was so unlike him. Yeah, it was all the time. But, <laughs> but well, to put it in context, the classes that I went to, he, he never really taught techniques. So I'd be like, all right, do the whatever drill. So he'd sit on his chairs, tell you to do it. And, and so you'd, you'd do the drill and my partner would try to help me but out. It was, but it was more that like the guys that had been around, which yeah, the so guys that did, weren't. Everybody mm. kind of knew it. There was another kid out there. I think his name was Lee. He was kind of younger of the crew, but he was pretty good. But, but mm. you know, you got Talgett, Billy and Ali, and then you've got Lee and then you've got, and then, then they you had got me. Rain, Rain was there for yeah, a while. Yeah. There was he a bunch was, of other guys. Those are the guys yeah. I remember. And I'm trying to do stuff and, and Sam's yelling at me like, stop doing that fucking jujitsu shit. And um, I was just like, what? but that's how it was. That's the exact. That's sentence. all you got. What's well, all I got? All I got. And like, that's it's the seats. I, I'm trying to take, take him, like, I'm trying to do stuff and I'm doing things that are illegal in freestyle because I don't know any fucking rules. <laughs> and like, Sam just keeps helping me. He's like, stop fucking doing that, bands of shit. And then I'm like, Sam, fucking show me something then. <laughs> and he's just kind of like, oh. And then the later that, that session, we're doing some an actual round as well. And I was with Billy Ollie, I can't remember which. And I, again, doing some stuff that it's annoying Sam. And Sam's like, just fucking smash him. <laughs> and I was like, oh, and, and whoever I was with, one of the boys, I think it was, I think it was Ali. I, he's, he's seen me just like turn white as a ghost. So I'm like, this guy can kill me if he wants to. And he's like, it's all right, man. I'll look after you. But I was like, Jesus Christ, I'm going to get fucking killed. Like I'm going to get suplex. I'm going to be dead. But he's like, no, nah, it's all good, man. It's all good. But, and after that moment, I was kind of like, oh, all the guys in this room are looking after me. It's all good. Um, and if you wanted to get good at freestyle, the guys in the room would actually help you out. The structure of the classes, I don't know what, what normal freestyle classes are like, but well, there was there it's not a class. It was no. a, it was a sports training. Like so we're gonna warm up, we're gonna do these and physical think, skills and then we're gonna get into it. And in hindsight, recognizing that what you were going into was like comp training rather than yes. an actual technique class and it makes sense. Uh, it only existed for one reason. Yeah. You were there to win com- competitions. Yeah. That's what you did. Yeah. But um from that though, that's when we got onto Tal and I was like, hey man, like like that come out and start teaching, you know, we've got the gym, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, awesome. And I believe that might've caused some friction between him and Sam. Yeah. Well, th- anything would have caused friction between Sam and the world Yeah. Uh, at that point. And it wasn't long after that, that the whole insurance thing with reference to combat sports yeah. almost fell apart because of an incident that happened mm-hmm. on that mat where a guy broke his neck yep. yeah. um, and was, was paralyzed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's, it, Actually, that was a little bit before that. It was, no, that had already happened. Um, yeah. And 
because I'd, I'd already heard about that. I knew that that was something that happened, but it happened not long before I actually started going out there and training. Yeah. But I think because I've been training jiu-jitsu for a little while and I was like, it's not like, I'm all good. Like, I'm yeah. not, like, I know enough to, you know, as long as these guys aren't going to try to kill me, I'll, I'll be all right. And they yeah. weren't. The guys are and all the, awesome. And, they, and, and, and Ali in particular, I think, was, was actually very, he was just an accommodating guy. Yeah, he was a really nice guy. And I'm pretty sure it was Ali who I was training with most of the time. I don't recall doing heaps around. He was him. he was there the most. He was good, yeah. He was, he was really good. Um, but Talgot was was amazing. And Talgot's like similar sort of size. Had a really fluid style too. Talgot, as I was saying to you, you, you in the break, he was the only guy I ever actually saw teach wrestling with a plan he actually taught wrestling yeah. and he obviously had sat down and thought about it this yeah. is where we're going to start this and is how we're going to proceed and that was by far some of the best coaching i had ever witnessed he's a he's a phenomenal coach which is one of the reasons why like back then i didn't know enough to know but i there was something in me like this is the guy to ask to come out so we get him to start start coming out and teaching classes and because we understood pretty early on which is a bit ahead of the curve. Like we need to have some freestyle wrestling. Um, and he started teaching there and he's been teaching with us ever since. But from that, like that was the, f- the first moment that he started branching out and teaching in, in other jiu-jitsu and MMA gyms. Mm. Uh, and now he's, he's, he's the wrestling coach that you go to. He's also the head of the AIS team and all you, that sort of stuff. You would go a long way to find a better coach. It, it'd opinion. be hard. It'd be hard. I'd he, say that I, he's the I best I remember wrestling. doing the warm-ups and, I, and I, I hung back from that. I sort of had my fill of wrestling. I was on another... Yeah sort of stage in my development but just watching him do the warm-ups and all that sort of stuff they do the wheelbarrows and all that yeah. sort of stuff and he would beat you guys up the mat on his hands most yep. athletic guy I've ever seen moved like a unbelievable. cat unbelievable like which is I think a combination of two things him and, one and is watching him and Costa train oh yeah. my god but Costa's yeah. got a very different style too like Costa's yeah. like got a smashing style or Talgut's like really Talget's fluid soft. Just and that was the thing I liked about Talgut he was like jujitsu for wrestling yes yeah um, and he, he has a like for the guys that have actually trained with him so you get guys that have been training jiu-jitsu for a long time uh, and then they they come in and they wrestle this guy who's wearing a white belt and they have a real hard time with him because he's really good at drawing remember you remember when in. he went in to the jiu-jitsu his first jiu-jitsu tournament we put him in like a pan packs in the brown belt we division. showed him one choke that was in between rounds, yeah, man. That was in between <laughs> after his first after first, his first match. match we showed him spinning choke or baseball bat choke. The baseball bat choke. I, clear as day. I'll, I'll never forget it. He just went out, which he marked at everyone, and baseball bat choked everyone. Yep. And yep. I was just like, oh my god, what, <laughs> have, was, we, what have we done? He would stand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he would stand right leg forward, passing. Because guys would pull guard and he'd stand right leg forward, yep. and they would grab his leg and they'd start coming up on a single, and they get <laughs> uchimarted, rinse and repeat. <laughs> And uh, there was a guy he must have done it to, I don't know, five times. He just kept, he couldn't help himself but to try to come up on the single leg. Well, that leg. was his plan. Yeah. And his plan just happened to not work against such an elite yep. grappler. Yep. But um, in yeah, I, like, like Talgut is, is the guy now for wrestling coaches. And we found him, um, we found him pretty early, but it was. Just a super nice guy as well. Yeah, he is. He's an re- like, awesome guy. He, again, he's been t- teaching at Dominance from really early on. Like probably, well, that, I'd say. I think that was his first teaching gig. It was, yeah, it was. literally. Yeah, it, it was, was literally. Um, and because I, I met him at, the, at training at Sam's and I was like, like, hey man, would you be interested in, yeah, and he said, so that 16 years ago, I'd say. Yeah. But it you just, know, that, that could have worked out so differently if Talgut wasn't Talgut. Yeah. If Talgut was anybody else, it would show up and it's like, okay, we're just going to do a wrestling practice. Yeah. He obviously sat down and thought about it. Yeah. Because the, the class that we got there was very different to the experience that we got at Sam's. Oh yeah. Um, and again, it's the difference between teaching a class and showing up for comp training. But just not knowing, like it, it's obvious now in hindsight that that training there was not designed to, to take someone from being, like knowing nothing about freestyle to being competent. And it was actually just training for the guys that were that were already good and trying to get them. And if you'd stepped into that room and you didn't know what you're doing, which most of us did, yeah. Uh, as far as freestyle wrestling, it was a lot of things were already assumed. Yes, it assumed that you knew the rules. Yeah, it assumed that you were a competitor. Mm. It assumed that you were physically conditioned enough just to keep up. Yeah. The conditioning side of things wasn't bad. Yeah, it was bad, but the technical knowledge and the rules, my, like, I don't know half this stuff. Yeah. I just, I just remember doing um, Sam taking us out for sprints on the on the VUT <laughs> oval, <laughs> and there was these stairs like run the stairs, eighty six freaking stairs. Forget it. <laughs> Those <laughs> the numbers. Tell it. I suppose people may not be aware, but he was a, I suppose, a product of the Soviet wrestling program. 
from a very young age. Yeah, come from his Well, that's, that's what I was going to say, right? The two things that he's got is he started at a very young age, I think six. Yeah, something ridiculous um, like that. And obviously he has some, some natural athletic attributes that lend him to freestyle, like the combination of those two things. Yeah. And now, judo too. He was a, yeah, he was, he was a national player. champion in judo too. Um, now, I would suggest though that if you start anything at six years old and you train it essentially the way that that system trains you, yeah. you're going to be... You're going to be at least good. So he would have learned. Either you system. break, yeah. and you're cold from the herd, yeah. or yeah. you become good. Yeah. yeah, you're one of the ones that make it. Yeah, yeah. there's not much in between. And he's, he's such a gifted guy. I, like you were saying about teaching him that spinning choke and then putting him into the comp, you'd show him stuff, and the next role he's using it on you, and you're like. Oh fuck! I have to actually really depend. Yeah, he's he's going to get dangerous this with it. Yeah, he yeah. was just like plug and play. And you, again, you could go, oh man, he's a freak. It's like, well, he's been doing a grappling art since he was six. Yes. Now you could say that freestyle and jiu jitsu are, are not the same thing, but there's a lot of crossover. Yeah. Not the way he thinks about it. Yeah, his no, mechanical and control. And he's correct. Yeah. He's thinking about it in terms of body mechanics. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to style. Yeah, and and, and rule sets. He doesn't. Yeah. yeah. He doesn't really just, dis- it was very evident <laughs> right from the beginning. He didn't really distinguish between the two. It was just like, uh, you're a collection of levers yeah. and that's what I'm going to use. Yeah. And you'd be coaching him like in a comp and, and he'd hold a guy and he'd look at you and you're like, okay, now do this and this and, and he'd like, and he'd do it. It's like, 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 like playing a video game. Yeah, he was. Like he, that, witnessing that for me actually had an influence on me. No, I, I agree 100%. That was I, my next point. It was from that moment forward that every human being became a bag of guts held up by a skeleton. Yep. And that was just how I operate and I still operate that way to this day. I think one of the things that, that we, I don't know if we picked it up from John or if it was something that just that came when we started teaching, but, and my students always hear me refer to it all the time and you guys, I know that you guys have said the same, but it's just a, a major lever and two minor levers and it's the way they got like spines, hips, shoulders. Um, but when you see someone like Talget do what he does because he understands body mechanics so well, you can get him to do something really, really easily that someone else might take a really long time because of doing wrestling for so long. Like all that stuff's there. The the core understanding, yeah, of that. Just you've got you've got really an amazing. You've got an ability to move your own body, and then you've got an, a, then you've got a deep understanding of of the mechanics that are at play. It becomes quite easy. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it's it. I mean, that was one of the 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 things really early on. I think that also started kind of separating what we were doing from uh, maybe some of the other gyms around. Like we're, we're trying to find the best people all the time and the, the information like what, what's the whole, how do we plug it? What, how, can we, how can we keep finding edges? Um, but yeah, like that, that, man, that, that phase there, like that space was small, but we had some great guys on the mat. And then the, the, uh, it was that space thing when, as I said, the, when Justin Christopher came on, and then his brother his DC, brother Dave came out, um, and so you know, DC is is a black belt By- under Byron his his uh, brother Jim. Sorry, his brother Justin and his coach Jim and myself. And now he has his own gym in um, in Campbell Academy Jiu Jitsu. Those guys, when I ended up moving moving on, they would visit me as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they they basically kept the, those those connections there. So they train they train with with us, they train with you, and they train with. Because they're back and forth from the states, and they're training with Jim back there. Yeah. Um. But those guys have all got their own gym now. So Justin in the states, um, DC here, Byron, who came, he was like basically he, day one before day one. Technically, he started at the hangar. Yeah. And then he, we had moved. How long at the hangar? You reckon he was there for? I I wouldn't have thought it was too long. I don't no. think it was even a year. No, it would have been less than a year. Less than a year, but he came with us because yep. he lived out that side of town. Yeah. I yeah. uh, lived in um, Blackburn. Yeah. So, so he's got his own gym now, which is Unity uh, with uh, Sean in Box Hill. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of guys that that started, you know, in that that very very first early space, um, and there was the guys that were part of the actual kind of uh, the the core crew. So there was like there's obviously us three. Um, John Simon uh, and Muzz was on the mat. Big Doug was coming out and training. So big, they, oh, God, we so had some battles. Doug, so big bro. Doug, so Diggs, big Doug's like six foot whatever and a hundred and... Six, six, four, half Dutch, half Maori and just lunatic. A, there was one day where you get... <laughs> but so, lovely guy. Yeah. Awesome. So Saturdays were epic. Like Saturdays were the day. Like we open mat. We just... We train like animals and beat the hell out of each other. And then we God, go down the street. We, and we really would just... Beat the snot out of each other. It was, it was like, just such rough jujitsu. Then it was. It, was, it wasn't refined, but it was also there was a different kind of vibe as well, where it was just crazy effective. 
Yeah, right. yeah. But it was it was also just that's about creating resilience. I think there was yeah, that was. going on. No, no, no one wanted to back down. So it was like, I don't care that you knew right in my face. I'm not we, tapping. We had, we. I remember us having discussions about how important just having some guts. Yeah, was. I think it is. I think that, that that still is the case, but now we allow it to happen over the course of months rather than one hour. Well, let, well, and, and also people are going to manifest that at different stages in their training. Yep. And they, Some people they, take a time, time to get there. And some people come in with it, but then you have to temper it so yep. that they will actually learn something. Yeah. So yeah, but also to make them good partners as well because right. they come on yeah. being a, just a, a, a chimp Jumping all over the place, if crushing everyone all of a sudden. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no one will train with me. Oh, I wonder why. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it, but back in the day when ninety percent of people walked out of the gym, all you're left with is the guys who are who are tough and don't mind that. But nowadays, you got many more people on the mat, and like, and you've got a lot of different people that have a lot of different lives. So you got working professionals, you got people who are you know like family, like all this stuff that they that they're balancing. You don't want to come to training and have the hell beat out of you. You have to deal with somebody who's twenty years old and going nuts and might potentially injure you. So becoming uh, what a, what is a good training partner now has changed yep. to what it was. Oh back yeah, then. and sure. and I think also the um, the personal pride yeah. that people took in being able to dominate another human being. Yeah, at that point was huge. It was, and it, and we would push each other so hard. Like it would be nothing for us to to get hurt, shake it off go back and that's the benefit of being in your 20s yeah that's it. <laughs> things are pop and the next day you're like it oh, made you hard we're good <laughs> but we're probably paying for it now <laughs> well yeah i mean there's, we all are. there's yeah. no doubt about that yeah. there's yeah. no doubt about that but yeah like like saturdays was was nuts man that was such a good session um but there was a there was a tightness around it. like i like was saying before like we we train like animals and then we go down and and eat at eddie wong's and just eddie shoot wong's shit. bro and everyone was super tight we hung out all the time but there was one Saturday in particular I remember Doggy rocking up to training and he was hung over as fuck. Like he'd been out late and he was and he was on the mat and he was doing rounds and he's like, just hold on a second, goes off to the bathroom, just throws up like a madman. That was washing himself. Think that was after our roll. Yeah. So Doug and I rolled and yes. he, he knee locked me and I didn't want to tap and I felt my knee click a little bit. I'm like, so I tap, I'm like, all right, now. I'm going to make him pay for that. So, so, well, and everybody knows, everybody knows that if if someone caught you back then and because you were one of the most senior guys in the room, you'd be just like, all right, let's go again. And it would go as long as you decided it wanted to go. And, and so, it and, was, it and was everyone knew it was like, all right, Dave's going to go with me until he feels like he's broken my soul. Yeah, it was either from and that's when Doug ran off the or mat until and, I've crushed. Yeah, I, was, crushed. I, I remember I, I choked him and he was hanging in there because he didn't want to give up either. Yeah. And we would push each other pretty hard and we were the two of the bigger guys on the, mm-hmm. on the mat. And we're pushing each other and pushing each other, and I, I ended up catching his back and choking him, and that's when that's when the yep. vomiting incident happened. He runs off, <laughs> throws up, like washes his face off, gets back on the mat, just keeps training. <laughs> let's go again. Yeah. Like, okay, let's go. And yeah. that's and that's how it was. And then and then what was it? An hour later, we were at Eddie Wong's, laughing our asses off, and yep, just yep. noodle in a box. Noodle, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, noodle, dear man. Yeah, that's man. A little place that would come out. In. You know, it's it's interesting. Like again, we had we ended up having not all, but a lot of the good guys from the hangar eventually kind of made their way across because yeah. most of the guys we were really tight with, um, and they also wanted the good training. And, so and, and Ollie, yep, Ollie, Ollie who and Doug were tight, super yep. tight, um, and, um, and and still are as, as far as I know. And Ollie ended up moving back to he's up in Margaret River or something uh, like Geraldton. that. Geraldton, yeah, Geraldton, Geraldton. yep. Yeah. You know he's got he's got a successful school now, and, mm-hmm. and then you know we we would have we would be almost be the place to visit because it used to be the hangar because you could stay there. Yeah, yeah. If you really but wanted now to, now was if you really wanted to, it was a little dicey. Yeah. I mean, you had half naked uh, Uzbek wrestlers running around the place. Like you remember Dimitri, Dimi, Dimitri, yeah. Dima, yeah. Dima. He would he would drink expired medicine because it's good for you. And <laughs> <laughs> I just remember one day we're walking up. It's like you you train like a like a dog, right? Yeah. And then you you have to walk up four flights of stairs. So you're dragging your ass up these stairs. And then you would see Dima's wrestling boots. One boot there, a sock there, another boot over there. And then you'd see his jacket and that's like in the hallway. Mm-hmm. And then you'd see his wrestling singlet and underwear. And you're just going, <laughs> where the hell is Dima? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Nothing left. <laughs> yeah, he was... Uh, his his happiness was directly proportionate to the amount of potatoes he was coming. <laughs> in the yeah, he was pretty unique, man. He but was he, a weird cat. I yeah, remember he tried to murder you, and it didn't work, and he got frustrated, and he 
Yeah. Keep going when it was when you were a white belt. There, there was a um. Then well, well there was Jeff as well. Jeff Trebant. No, no, no. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, so which has, is this? Has this very crazy Iranian story? Jeff? Iranian, Iranian Jeff. Yeah, who Mars Mars mentioned very briefly. Crazy story. He met a very untimely demise. Oh, I know. Uh, on Landall's Road, and that's one street away from where my wife lives. <laughs> or, really, or wife lived at the time. <laughs> hopefully, uh, that hopefully it's improved a little bit since then. I'm sure <laughs> that particular name would got so, better without him in it. So Iranian, Iranian Jeff had a had a freestyle wrestling background as well. So he was a bigger dude, and he was over here for whatever reason. I, I um, managed to piss him off a bunch of times. That was always yeah. Nice. He um he had a hard time. I found that one thing though that that. For some reason, he seemed to he seemed to be okay with me because it makes it sound like he's an asshole. He's actually he was actually a really nice guy um, in the gym, and like I never really hung out with him. Um, mm. But uh, he seemed to be totally fine with me because I was a lot smaller than me, and he and he had a hard time with me, and that was enough for him to be like, "You're all right." If you were about his same size and you were a threat to him, yeah, you were not cool with with him, yeah, and and. <laughs> I, I remember having a discussion. He, look, yes, wrestler, yes, understood, yes, experienced, had no idea about jiu-jitsu. No. And I said to him, and I, I thought it was diplomatic, but obviously it was not. Um, <laughs> I'm a lot better than all, all this. The start at of is, most of your stories. <laughs> all, all I'm thinking is a mix of how you were back then and how uh, he was. It was probably, you know, somewhere Actual in the middle. Fire, <laughs> so I suggested that, look, you need to learn some basics about jiu-jitsu. And then he went and complained to Tyrone. And Tyrone said, well, he's upset with you. And I said, well, if you had any balls, he'd come and tell me directly. <laughs> So that got back to him. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, it turned into a thing. And then years later, I find out he was connected with some pretty dodgy stuff. And I was like, whoa, that was interesting. Yeah. I had a lot of moments like just in, in those gyms and stuff, like p- particularly connected with kickboxing and things like that. Like, and I, w- I would wise off to somebody and I find out two years later that he's now in the can for killing a guy or something. <laughs> yep. I even... I even worked for a guy that was prominent in the underbelly series as a teenager. I used to work in the service station that he owned. Jeez. Well, I think some and of that stuff. It was just like, what the hell? Some yeah, of we stuff didn't you even get know away it, with because of know. good fortune. And the other one that probably contributes as it well was, is you're a, you're a kid, you're young. It was good luck rather than good management. Yeah. I'll tell you that. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, man, like it's there was uh, there were so many good guys. There were so many good guys that were training, and it, it kept us all good, and it was really pushing us along because. If if you if you were having an off day, it was a tough room, and someone else was having a good day, you're in trouble. It was a tough room, and nobody wanted to back down. No, but everyone was tight. Yep. Yep. If if, if there was ever a situation where someone had a disagreement with somebody, it was settled on the mat, yep. and that's where it stayed, and that was, and then it was over. Did you come to the? There was when we were at the hangar. There was a competition that we went to in Sydney, where there was a bunch of us. Gerald, we all like we jumped in a car, we drove ten hours to Sydney, did the competition, and drove back. I don't think I was there for that one. Yeah, there was like five of us in a car, and like the four of the guys are over six foot and hundred kilos, and there's me just so like John. Will used to call it the swamp. Yeah, because it was just yeah. full of these. Like I mean, Gerald. Yeah, he did too. Lee, me. Yeah. Yep. Tyrone. Yeah, it was a little giants there was, giants over there. There was some ridiculous. big guys. It was. That, that was the thing when I first started at Wangaratta Street as well. Like, again, I was small. Like, I, I walk around at about, you know, 74, 75, but I was 62 back then. Mm. Um, and mainly because I was just an underfed kid. Like, I was trying to be vegetarian for no smart reason and just, but doing it super unhealthy. Basically, just eating like pasta, pasta sauce and <laughs> cheese, like, literally. Um, and, uh, and everybody seemed huge. And yeah. because George. Tavern was next door, and they had like the the, yeah, know, the bodybuilding the, gym. The, the, no, not a single steroid in that place. No, no, oh, no. Clean, all the steroids cleaners. in that place. All the steroids were in that place. Um, but I, I went next door, and I was just like, I'm, and I was speaking to him, like, I want to start lifting, and because I, I, I want to get stronger and a bit bigger, because you know all these guys are so much bigger than me, I'm just getting crushed. He's like, you must eat meat, because he found out I was a vegetarian. And I started taking like protein and amino acids and the creatine and all these things that taste disgusting. None of none of the illegal shit. Um, Don't worry, it was only one short step away. Yeah, <laughs> right. um, but you know, <laughs> gateway supplement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, to be honest, I didn't even know about any of that shit back then. I was just like, you know, I wasn't. I was a couple of years from living in the country and just didn't know yeah. anything about anything. Different world. Um, but I, I started eating meat and taking and taking it. I remember it was like creatine, protein, 
I'm gonna say El Cunty. Up to All the three no, kilos. man. Like in four weeks, <laughs> in literally in four weeks, I went from 62 to 75 kilos, and I've been the same weight ever since. Which is a testament to the fact that I was basically starving. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. More than because I stopped taking all that shit and the weight stayed the same. And, and you stayed, yeah, yeah, pretty yeah. Give or take, like you know, 72, 73. But, um, and I remember you got up to like 78, and that was such a push. There was one like, <laughs> so Mars, who you know, the guys are listening know who's who's the um, the head coach and the and uh, owner at Bentley. Um, so he's a personal trainer, his wife's a personal trainer as well. And I was lifting with her for quite some time, and and the goal was like, I just want to hit 80 kilos, I just want to see if I can get to 80 kilos. So we we're just deadlifting a lot. And just eating a lot. And I, I tipped 80 kilos on the scales once. And I'm like, I'm fucking done. Because I was, I was sick of eating, man. Nearly, I was like, this it is nearly shit. nearly killed me to get there. So yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. I wasn't eating bad, but just it, like eating became a job. I'm like, this is fucked. Like, this is not enjoyable at all. And it, it also, it's like forcing your body, whether it's going down or going up, there's a, there's a zone that your body's happy to be in. And for me, it's between kind of uh, 72 and 76 kilos it's happy with. But if I if I know if I hit seventy, something's wrong. Mm. Um, and if I go above that, I'm having to force it, and it turns into a job, and it's just not worth it. Um, but when I started, I was little, and everyone else on the mat was fucking huge, and I, like it was, it became very noticeable. I'm like, God damn it! I'm like, and and it would have been okay if those big guys really didn't have much of a clue about what was going on. But also the other thing that that made it hard was that that there was not whole lot of technical depth in the room there just wasn't much knowledge around right so we were working with by today's standards by the standards at the time it was bleeding edge yeah good as anyone by today's standards it would be considered almost spartan the the amount of the amount of of knowledge technical understanding that was at one's fingertips not to mention the amount of experience people had. It wasn't like now. I mean, obviously, the current times uh, notwithstanding, you got a tournament almost like a, a, a decently mm-hmm. turned out tournament at least once a month. Yeah, it's it's totally different. It's and the resources again. You know, we're trying to like scratch together some VHS tapes, and so there's just not much depth, which meant it was harder for the smaller guy to actually get the technical tools to be able to survive well. So mm-hmm. it's basically like take your beatings and then. You, you're going to figure some stuff out. Maybe some people show you some shit. Uh, but if you didn't have that that kind of thing in you, if you weren't willing to just to, to be the nail for a while. If, if you weren't tough enough to withstand it and at the same time analytical enough to deconstruct what happened. Yeah. It wouldn't even, it, it was harder for being a lighter guy. Yeah. For sure. But it wouldn't matter what weight you were. No. Everyone no. had to take their lumps and you had to be smart enough to figure out a lot of this stuff on your own. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. we were all encouraged to do. Yeah, absolutely. John was uh, was phenomenal in that. Again, we, we always kind of reiterate that. He's fantastic at making students good learners and, and making people really good at, at at drawing that information from the room that they're in. Yeah, you know, the one of the things he always, always says is like, you, you can't rely on your coach to be able to give you the information. And that's well, true. And that was, we've all visited various mats in in our years Mm -hmm. and we always managed to take something away from those experiences where i could very safely say that not everyone that was present in that room extracted as much information no no not at all not at all so we had we had that experience at um at swan street like these guys that were it was it was just a good room to be part of and we're bringing in other guys like talget Mm. Um, and Talget's and, and the same today where he's he's active in his classes too so it's not just this guy with a lot of knowledge that sits on the sideline do this do that he's, he's not doing a yoga he's, thing with his little stick no he's, he's in there he's, and he's, he's, there. he's sparring with you and he's training and he's so you, you're getting to feel what really good freestyle feels like and you might be starting to, to have some success against the other guys in the class who are other jiu-jitsu guys trying to do wrestling and then you partner up with him and you're like Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Mm. Like, I don't know anything. This is, this um, is where it's at. But in a really good way. Like, it's... Yeah. and Because so much I feel like of jiu-jitsu is assimilation. It's like the Borg. You know what I mean? Like, mm. you experience the thing and that gives you the... the That gives you enough of the the, the sensory input uh, and the idea of it to be like, oh, that's something I should grab and use. And quite often I feel like we get a lot of, a lot of what we put into our game from having it being done to us. 
And it might even be our students who are five belts below us, but they do something that's kind of a little bit interesting. You're like, oh, that's an interesting idea. And it, and it does pique your interest and you do. Yeah. And sometimes it's someone better than you and they just flog you with it, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I've had those experiences with with a bunch of really, really good guys. As have we all. Yeah. For sure. And it's easier, obviously, when you're lower ranked because you, you've got more guys that are better than you. Um, and as you move up, those experiences are fewer and farther between, but you tend to take notice of them all because they happen less frequently. Uh, but Swan Street was... We're starting to kind of draw those guys in and get all that experience in the room and there's that mentality there. And I think when the gym moved to Bridge Road, that was the time when that really became very cohesive. Yeah. Yeah. Part of it was the space allowing things to 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 like really kind of blossom a little bit because mm. Swan Street was very, very small. And we had these guys that were training really well, you're, hard. You're limited by the amount of people you can pack on the yeah, yeah. And um, the personalities then. Yeah, the right? s- and the influence and the space on the space on Bridge Road as, as well allowed us to separate, so we could run two different groups at the same time. So we had the Muay Thai uh, in one time slot, and then we had the Jits in the other time slot because the mat was bigger. We had a beginner group and an, an intermediate group, for lack of a better phrase. Yeah. Uh, and then we had so there was the advanced guys, like like as in there was you, John Simon, um, who rotated through the advanced class, Muzz for a bit as well. But we rotated that advanced coaching slot, John Jensen, John, yeah, the Reb as well. Um, so it, it made sure that all the guys, um, all the students were getting exposure to all the, all the top guys games. So it just wasn't one way of thinking. Um, and then we had that, that kind of the, the beginners class where we're like making sure that everyone's got really good fundamentals, which again was like, it was ahead of the curve a bit because a lot of, a lot of coaching was, was pretty loose. It wasn't very structured. And especially at that time. Yeah. Whether you're talking about an actual curriculum or a pathway from, from white belts first day to to blue belt or whether you're talking about the actual class structure itself because a lot of it was like if you want to think of it in a lot of other gyms anyway from what i gather kind of like an open mat where the coach would be like hey guys check this out show a move for five minutes and they go all right off you go back to your own thing kind of yeah. you know that was about as structured as some of the gyms got and we were able to lure john will back as well yeah and john had come back yeah. over and started teaching on a monday night again for us he was that no longer happening that started happening in swan street did it? Yeah, yes. it did. It oh, did. Okay. You're right. Yeah, it oh. did. We, I remember we, us having the discussion. We had to sit down. It's like, it's going to cost us X amount to make sure that it happens. Oof. And we're like, gee, scratching our heads. So like, <sighs> yeah. We we're reaching into our back pockets like, okay, we've got to make it happen. Yeah. You know. But it was important to us as well because we wanted to have that information still flowing in. Um, and, and you know what? It just goes to show when something's really important to you, you find a way to make it happen. Yeah, so when we sat down with um with uh, Lincoln Muzz and I sat down with Dan Kelly a little while ago and we were chatting about because oh, he's a legend he's got so much experience and so much success across my the first judo fields. tournament he kicked my ass he's a beast man <laughs> but Dan said something that that stuck with me and it's I was thinking about this in the car the other day and uh, he said you make excuses to go to training you don't make excuses not to and I think it's the same idea where you find ways to make things happen if it's important to you you will find a way you will find a way now i'm not saying that you should do that you know to the expense of your wife and child ending up homeless and on the street because you neglect all your other responsibilities well that's that's at a point now where it's irresponsible yeah it's yeah crazy. but you you find a way to do what's important but at that time in our lives we didn't have anything else we we, we didn't need to worry about that no no not at all um but yeah then we moved to to the bigger space and so that that space was was great because it wasn't um it, it it allowed it allowed the physical space is bigger and it allowed us to do more things and the the group kind of grew so so we left we started at Swan Street with eighteen people we left there with eighty four and over the three years yeah we got to one hundred and eighty before we moved yeah to I think it was one hundred and eighty three that we left yeah. there with I remember those numbers distinctly because they were I remember thinking about just like where where that sat financially what we needed to like the spaces that we're going to, how many members they could hold, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I'm always like, is this the right move for us? And I remember that, that when we signed the lease on Swan Street and we were like, fuck, $14,000, what if it goes wrong? And then the lease for, for Bridge Road was around 30. 35. And we were signing that lease and we are like, fuck, what if it goes wrong? Yeah. And uh, see, at, at that point too, this is, this is a little noteworthy as well. At that point, I was bought out by you guys. Yeah. Yeah, you wanted to step out of the... I, I was... A, I was, You know what the crazy thing was? I wasn't really 100% sure where I was going, but I needed to go. Yeah. Well, and so... Yeah. So, like, but I, and I stuck around as a, an instructor, 
and but it was you guys running the business at that point and that was when that 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 move really took it to the next level and and personally i it, the smart thing for me to do would have been to stay right where i was but mm, yeah i don't think the success that dominance ultimately would have had would have been either as quick or as good had i been a part of that yeah it's it's in hindsight you can look at things and go i'll look at the the journey that like the path that it went on because we saw what came after it um but had i been there would that have happened that it would have been different but you don't know what the different is right so it's it's hard to know but everyone's ended up uh you know i'm I'm definitely not going to say everyone's ended up where they should be because it's like fake all that shit, right. like crystals and bullshit. Fuck off. Um, <laughs> but what I am just going to say though is everyone's ended up in a good place. Yeah. Right. Now, there was, because there was a moment there and I remember because there was, like you were, you were studying at uni and the decision that you'd, that you'd made or what you'd expect us that you wanted to focus on your study and it seemed pretty which, clear. Which ultimately I did not pursue a career right. in, which, which is, is funny but, enough. But like you're saying, because like, you didn't know what you wanted to do but you just knew that what was happening right then wasn't, wasn't working and that's and and just in terms of life, but also jujitsu as well. I, I had a real uh, adverse time with competing. Yeah, I was still not like I got my black belt at the Bridge Road Academy, mm-hmm. and at the time, I believe, and I'm happy to be corrected. Uh, at the time, I think I was the youngest black belt in the country. Yeah, I was 26. Although my skills may have fit the bill. Yep. Technically, without a doubt. I don't believe my maturity was quite there yet. And I still was not 100% sure about what that meant to me. Yep. Um, so, yeah, you know, I can look back now being 42. I mean, okay, well, it's very different now. Mm. But, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a, 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 an interesting time. Mm. And I think... That and it's, it's great times, you know. But had I been a part of that, I don't think that that would have worked out. I don't know what influence it would have had or would not have had. But I think it was important for me to take that step back, not just for me, but for everybody. There was something that was happening at the time. It, like it, it's it's interesting, right? Because there was leading up to that, there was a change in the vibes in the gym. Uh, and with you, with what was going on, it was pretty clear that that something wasn't vibing for you. And then, and we were—I remember, I was like, man, we need to we need to sit down and have a chat with Dave and find out what's going on. Well, at that time too, uh, my girlfriend at the time that that all fell apart, and I was just not in a good place. But it's it's very shortly after that, so we didn't even get to the point where like we need to have a chat with Dave. And then you're like, hey guys, it's time for me to still want to be involved in coaching, still want to be part of it, but I want to get study. I want to like. And like it, it all ended up sorting itself out for lack of a better phrase. It did. And I actually felt really like I knew that that conversation had to be had. And I felt confident in coming to you guys with that. Cause that's the sort of, yeah, sure. We would disagree on things and whatever, but it was always a situation where we could always sit down and talk to each other. I, th- I that think it was a really good thing. Yeah, it wasn't about what you did. It was how you did it. Yeah. It was right. always done the right way. So, so I think one of the things that we realized probably at that point, at least for me as well, if you're looking at things from from a business perspective and just the evolution of us as individuals is at some point that where there's a chance that, that we're going to end up on different paths. And the way I kind we of think about it... We were in our 20s. Yeah. Yeah. That was inevitable. Yeah. And we had, we had some things in common, but there was also enough differences that over time... So it might be that you're only, your course is only one degree different. Mm. And for the first year, that doesn't make any difference. But you, you, you extrapolate that over years and then you end up far enough apart that you can't, like, hang on, we need to actually, we need to actually separate. Mm. And, and you know what? It was, like you said, like that, that one little degree of difference that put me on a path where I met my beautiful wife, shout yep. out to Saba, and, you know, I've now got a family and mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff. Had that decision not been made, maybe that would not have taken place. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you know, so but it's it, an interesting thing, you know. It is an interesting thing. Like you could look at it and go, maybe the smart thing would have been to st- like, no, the smart thing is not because you're doing jujitsu in the way that you want to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like, you know, we we like obviously Cam and I are not business partners either. So there was a there's a point where so we've ended up at Victoria Street and we're doing all these things. So we went from a space 
that was, uh, said we had one mat, 220 meters. It was, it was still small in the sense that we, we had like one evening class that we taught. We had lunch classes and that was kind of it. So we were working, I think we did the math on it. We we're doing like 10 hours a week. Oh, something ridiculous. It was like, oh, they were the days. and again, you can look at it in hindsight and go, why the fuck did we ever change that? But you can't stay static. Like things have to be moved. They're always moving in one direction or another. It's either forward or back. There's no static. That's the only constant is change. And if you think that things are staying static, then you'll move them backwards. You just don't realize. Yeah. So like, and you've, I think you've always got to be trying to put, it's like even the same with jujitsu in general, but like, jujitsu is not static. It's always changing and evolving. I think that's why some people have a hard time with it is because you can't learn some information and then just do it the same way for the next 20 years and that's it. Because it's always, the arts are always getting better. There's always more nuance. There's always, the way that we teach um, basic stuff now is not the same as we taught it 15 years ago because our understanding has gotten better and the, the knowledge in the scene has gotten better. And the same same is true with the business. The business has to be moving and, and adjusting. It's needs yeah. to change, yeah. And, and you know, we, we ended up moving to Victoria Street, which I remember when we were looking, when we were moving out of Swan Street, we were looking for a space and this space came up and we looked at it and we, were, we actually offered the landlords, can we just rent half of it? And they said, no, fair enough. Yes, yes. So then we ended up moving into Bridge Road yep. and it was at that point, was it before we moved or was it after we moved that that you just, you, you we bought you out and yes. then you just started it was, coaching? It was before the move. Yeah, That's before, right. Yeah, because yeah. I remember that the timing ended up being good and I think you were, part of it was like, you know, like, like you guys wanted to make it bigger and I don't think I'm really like, like, like that committed to that path. And um, I wasn't. I, you know, I can I can say now, hindsight being twenty twenty, that I probably would have been a liability to that process. Yeah, it's yeah, it's hard to know in the moment. It's um, hard to know, but I, I, of course, wanted to contribute. Yeah, I think that's one of the things. Way. So we have those experiences where the mat that we had, we beat the the, the cheese out of each other, but it was you know like it existed in a way that that it forced honesty in the people that were in that space. Um, everybody knew who everyone was but because the, you see each other at their best and their worst all the time. It was the team that came first though. Yeah. And which is why when you're like, hey, like I want to step back and we, we very quickly um, found, like really quickly found an, a, an agreement with buying you out that was really good for everybody. But we're also like, yeah, cool, keep coaching. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. It's a no brainer. But the team had to come first. Yeah. That was that, that was it. Yeah. And then, um, and then, so yeah, I think three years, I'm going to say that we're there. Yeah. And, uh, well, with A1 Fitness and then that, that gym got bought that out. That got bought out. So, well, and a little bit of backstory on that. So, we subleased that space. Yep. And, um, and I'm trying to think of the name of the guy that owned it. There was two guys that owned it. Oh, man. Yeah. I'm trying to think of the name because he was a cool dude. And he found Pretty out my backgrounds. Going. He's yeah. Going, he's going, dude. And he's yeah. like, hey, do you, we need a manager for the gym. Do you want to manage it? And I was like, this could work out all right because I'm like right next door to the th- – like, like, so yeah. – while the gym was building up because it wasn't paying us enough for a full-time wage by any stretch. Nope. Um, and it took some time to build us up. I was working in the gym. And then they ended up selling the gym to another guy. Um, we'll just call him Joe for now. Um, Joe was a fuckhead. Um, and he didn't like that there was a blood <laughs> sport in the gym. And like, oh, yeah. it was a real, like basically over the course of three years, well, sorry, not three years because he didn't own it for that long, but he, he basically tried to push us out. It was over about a year and a half, two years, year and a half to two yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, instead of like, it's kind of like what you were talking about just with Jeff. It's like, why don't you just come and talk to me? Like, just tell me what's going on. But instead try to find little technicalities about this, that and the other. Just, t- just putting the thumb screws on just a little yeah. bit more, a little bit so more. You just, I, I remember having, even though I was removed from the business part of it, we, we would often talk. Yeah. And the, he just was not shooting straight dice. No. He was not honest with you. He was, he was in my opinion, weak for not having the discussion. If, if he, he just, just sat down and said, had the hard talk, he goes, look, guys, this is what I want to do. Yeah. You guys can't be here. That would have... We would have been everyone like, a lot of time. We would have been like, "Cool, respect that. That's that's what you want to do." And all right, we'll go try to find a place as give quickly us, as we give can. Give us time to find yeah. a place, and, and we're and, out of here. And yeah. his, he, I remember his cop out was always, "Oh, I'm just doing business. How my father taught me." It was like, "Well, you way that you're doing it's really fucked." Yeah, <laughs> Sack up, dude. It was. So yeah. we ended up kind of, <laughs> we kind of forced his hand on it a little bit because it was just, just like, dude, like, why don't you just fucking tell us? Um, but anyway, we got to that point because it was a cool space and we, we, we liked the arrangement there because it worked really well. It was great. He didn't seem to understand that there was a symbiosis there, that some of our students are going to want to join the gym and train and he's going to, that's going to generate some income. He, he didn't see it that way. No. He, was, he was like, you were taking up space for him to 
you know, uh, culminate his master plan. Yeah. And however he had it. So we, yeah, we ended up hunting out. for another space um, when all that happened. And we ended up back at that same building, Victoria Street, but now ready to rent the whole thing. Yep. And I remember when we were looking at signing lease for Victoria Street. And at this stage, the, like, the lease had moved from 30 grand into six figures. And the feeling that we had was like, holy fuck, what if this works out? And I was like, hang on, I've had this feeling two times before. The feeling's exactly the same and it doesn't matter what the numbers are. And then straight I was like, it's fine. We did it. Yeah, yeah we did it's it. It's fine. Yeah. I was the shaky one. You'd be like, no, no, it's fuck. We're good. We're good. I'm like, okay, let's do it. Well, but <laughs> the numbers are the numbers, right? Well, in your defense though, you were also the person that managed the books. Mm. Yeah. But I recognized that. that you carried that stress. You just, well, you're kind of adding some zeros on or you're changing the numbers, but the stress is the same. Mm. It's, it's just the fear of just making the next step. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like. But once you commit, you commit. Yeah. Well, there's no. You can't, you can't be half in, half out. You can't be half pregnant, as you would say. Um, can't be a little bit knocked up, bro. Yeah. So it's <laughs> at that, that stage where like, man, we've got this, this big thing. So all of a sudden we went from one mat to two mats. Um, we went from basically having lunch classes and like one, one lunch class of jits. I don't know if we did more time, did we? No, we, no, just like, just lunch. Two, yeah, two just, jits just, lunch just, classes. Sorry, yeah, just two jits classes. Um, and yeah. we had one evening class of jits, one evening class of Muay Thai. All of a sudden we had two mats. We've got two classes in the evening of jiu-jitsu every night, two of Muay Thai. We've got lunch classes every day. The front of house like side of things had to expand significantly. So everything, like not just the rent went through the roof, but everything else just went fucking bang. And we're like, whoa. And, and yeah. we, we took a, a pay cut to kind of facilitate well, yeah, we were Because um, Bridge Road had finally, we were able to live off an income off Bridge Road. Yeah. So we're just, and we're, like you were saying, we're doing 10 hours. We're living sweet. We Life spent summer good in the his, park throwing the aerobi. Yeah, throwing the aerobi, working our business plan. Yeah, and then we've gone to this, gone to <laughs> Victoria Street, and pay cut more hours. It's like, what have we done? Yeah. It was from it the was outside that. looking in, though, because at this time, I was you were Bayswater by then. Weren't you? I was at Bayswater by then, yeah. mm. and just from the outside looking, I was like, "No, nah, these guys have done it." Like just from where I was standing, I'm like, yeah. "Wow." These, these guys because are there it. was there was I can't even really think there was maybe extreme there was no yeah. other well they, you were very much more than I was you were like I want to be big I want to be the biggest and I want to set the, set the example and I'm yep. like yeah cool it sounds great let's do it and I can't was, think of another gym in Melbourne that was that no, was on that there level. was a bit of a monopoly at the time there yeah. was sort of like the big three yeah, yeah. and as far when as jiu-jitsu guys, guys like we, we talk yes. about this just as jiu-jitsu. As far but, as jiu-jitsu guys are concerned. But really we were an MMA gym at that point because yep. we had, yes, we had you, the Muay Thai. You had, you had evolved. And also it's like when that place came to fruition, it's like new player in town. Yeah. yeah. Two, yeah mats, pro- two separate mats. Two separate mats. Huge area. Place, place yeah. was awesome. Yeah. It was pretty good. And it was like it, it went through a few um, iterations while we were there. So that was kind of like dominance 3.0. And then we had like a 3.1 and a 3.2 while we were there. We made the like rookie era of doing renovations whilst working in the space, which, and if any of you have like grown up in a house and your parents have decided to renovate while you're Don't living in that. it, it's a fucking nightmare. It's like, yeah, yeah, this is only going to be two weeks, kids. Six months later, it's still going. Yeah. Um, so we did that and that, but we, we were always pushing to improve the space. But one of the things that was was kind of happening there was, I guess it was the same thing that we were trying to do in our jiu-jitsu skills is like, we we're always trying to push it. Like, how can we make this better? Like, how can we, like, there's got to be a way to do more with this. And it wasn't just about like, we want to be the biggest uh, and that that makes us the best. It was like, how, we do, how do we provide just the best? So it's the provision of the best possible training. And there's some facilities that go along with that. And then there's also just some professional, like we're going to provide great facilities. We should have good systems around it. The place should be clean. The place should be like all these things that are a bit of a no-brainer. And that's, and that's when you look at any successful academy yeah. or gym, anything like that, well, the systems run the place. You got yeah. it. And, and I figured that out way later. Yeah. Um, I, I was, you know, while you guys were putting systems together, I was still, you know, um, trying to click two rocks together to make fire. Yeah, um, as far as that was concerned, I, got, yeah, I, ran, I that, ran a good class. That was pretty much it. So the, the good <laughs> fortune for me was the backgrounds in sales and the fitness industry and understanding because everything when you're on the phone was scripted. Right. So it's like, this is like literally the script that you read and then you had a sheet of objections. So they knew that X percentage of the time, this would be the like, you're like, hey, so blah, 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 Jim. Oh yeah, I don't really have the time. Well, here's what you say when they say that. 
oh, actually, you know, I can't, you know, because I've got his, like, we've actually, you know, we've got a crash. But like, so there's literally everything, including the conversations, are systemized. The most, the most common scenarios have already been played out X amount of times, hence you've been able to establish which are the most common. What is jujitsu, man? All we're doing is making a system out of chaos. What happens the most frequently? Make sure we have an answer for that. And you get to, like, this happens 80% of the time from this position. And then you get to a point this where you different kinds 10% of, of the time, this happens. This. Yeah, exactly. So I think because of that, I was fortunate that I, I was able to bring that in. And so yeah, if, for if, sure. if you look at the growth that we had, it took us two and a half to three years to get 84 members. It took us another three years to get to just under 300 members. So the growth started changing as well. It was... Um, you kind of hit a critical mass and things start to grow a lot quicker yep. because of two things. One is the time in the market when no one knew what jiu-jitsu was. And the other thing was uh, like critical masses, right? Like the first 50, I, like, I got a lot of people that come to me in there, whether it's my guys starting a gym or other people um, come to me and talk to me about, oh, I'm going to start a gym or blah, blah, blah. The first 50 are always the hardest to get. It's yep. they're, they're, That's the most, and it's in that period of the first 50 where you're going to be going, fuck, man, did I did I make a mistake? Should I, like, is this thing going to work? Because they're, they're really hard to get the first 50 through the door because when you've got a class and there's no one in it, it doesn't look very appealing to the next person who's coming in. To, but once you get, it, and depending on the size of your room, so there's no point, the size of the gym we've got now, you absolutely would not want to start from this from day one because when you've got very small classes, there's there's not enough there's not enough life to fill the space. Yeah. And, it's a momentum the, thing. Yeah. yeah. And, there, and there's no confidence. Yep. In, like someone looks at that and they go, oh, okay, you've got all this stuff. Yep. But who's using it? Yes. All the show, but none of the go. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. So you've got to be really careful. I think it's, there's a, there's a natural kind of growth process that happens in all organic systems. And it's the same in business as well, where you start off small and you learn some lessons, you go a bit bigger, you learn some lessons, you go. So the small risks and mistakes prepare you for the bigger risks and the bigger mistakes. I think that's also the jujitsu mentality that we all had when we were all trained together at once was there, there, there is that sense of, you know, we're going to push each other. We're going to, we're going to find a way to make it better. We're going to, yeah. We're going to do those things. And it wasn't a matter of if, but when. Yep. And that's just how it was going to go down. Yep. When when we're in that phase as well of like, so we're, we're tool, still talking about we're in our 20s. We were. Uh, Wait, how old are you now? Me? Oh, really? Old. No, I'm 46 now. All right. So you're, you're five years older than me. You're one year older than me. But I'm pretty sure that we were still in our 20s at that stage. Yeah, we were for sure. Because it was 23, 24 when we started it. Um, two and a bit years, three years. So yeah, still still twenties. And I think there's something about that as well. You don't have you don't have families like, you know, we were we were either responsibilities. That we're are either we're <laughs> either single or partners that that you know me at the time partner who trained, so it was easy to be kind of in it. But super hyper focused on this one thing. Like everything revolved around jujitsu and then our business, which was jujitsu as well, which made it really easy to just be like just always pushing, always pushing, always pushing. But at some point life will start to pull you in other directions and it can be easy to fuck up the balance and you can fuck it up in one direction or the other. And one might be not putting enough time and focus into that your, your family or your other work or whatever it might be, or taking too much away from your business. Um, other things can fuck that up as well, which could be some sort of crisis and it might be a, a breakup or it might be something else that, that takes your focus away. Um, and I, I can look back now cause it's been 18 years that we've had the gym of, of where the peaks and troughs have been. And I can pinpoint exactly where my head was when there was a trough and when we started to lose some momentum and what was going on with my headspace. And even if at that trough, it wasn't you, it was someone else very closely connected to yeah. the business at that time. Oh yeah, 100%. That, that, was, that was what was going on. Yeah, but there's, it's, it's very, very clear. There's ups and downs. It's pretty natural because you have to learn lessons in business as well. And, and a lot of the really important ones, you, you, can, only, you can only know them you have to get armbar to learn to keep your arms in. It's, it's super, super cliche and cheesy, but it's true in the, in business. And, um, you know, sooner or later you, you learn some big lessons and then you go forward and you, you don't have to learn them once again. But there was a growth with it that we, that happened. Those first 50 members are pretty hard to come by. And for anyone out there who's just started a gym, especially now, cause we've got COVID going on and, and people aren't necessarily starting a new gym. They're restarting their old gym and they, they might be going through that same process again. Like you just got to remember that the first 50 are hard to come by. 
the yeah. magic number is 100. When you get to 100, everything's pretty sweet from there. It's, that's like the, like 50 is like, cool, we're okay. 100 is like awesome because then the momentum really starts to go. Um, and the, the vibe builds itself, but then yeah. you run into other problems. You do. Meaning that you, you figure out very, very quickly that the culture of any organization has a shelf life of about a week if left unattended. Yeah. When it's really small, it's it, it's being taken care of organically by by its smallness. You're connected is, to everybody because it's it a small when, group. When we were all coming up yeah. Yeah. as you know, blue belts and purple belts, it's like it wasn't big enough to diverge. It yeah. was the, the, yeah. the more senior students sort of ran shit, yeah. basically. Ha- happened passively. Well, and we're, yeah. we were all in the space all the time. Yeah. All yeah. the time. So like we were we were on it. Like everything that was happening in the space, we, we knew what was going on, but then it gets to a certain size where you can't have your eye on everything all the time. Um, and you've got other things that start to creep in that take responsibility. You know, you have a relationship that you actually care about more than jiu-jitsu or enough to divert some attention, you, you know? You, you give it, you prioritize things differently. Yeah, which is not a bad thing. Like it might sound like I'm like, I'm it's saying actually, it's bad. I think it's important. It's really important. I think everyone needs to It's really that. important. Um, at some point. But over time, right, so this, the, you, you know, your gym starts to grow to a certain size and then you start to run into some of these problems. And if you've got morning lunch and evening classes, because that's where we ended up going, like 6 or 6.30 a.m., 12 lunch and then two evening classes. Yes, it's possible to teach all three of those um, sets of those classes, sure, for a period, but very quickly you're going to get burnt out. You're going to be phoning it in. Um, do, do, do one shift. to see the... You early, do early in day or day and late, but don't do all no, three. No, yeah, <laughs> and it's and all, like you know, some people try to alternate, but that doesn't work. Either. Like you need consistency, right? Like yeah. you can't be getting up at six a.m. one day and then the next day at ten a.m. Like it just doesn't work. So, like you're saying, you do lunches and evening, which is what I do. And I have Max, who's one of my uh, uh, brown belts, is a beast. He does the mornings, um, and that works out really well. But we learned really early on that there was a limit to um, like how many hours. Obviously, you can't have your day spread from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., but also roughly how many hours of teaching you could do before you start to get to that point where you're like, I don't have anything left to give. Yeah, Like, exactly. I'm at Wednesday, and I've got nothing left and to give. I think people forget that, too. It's like, you can get on a mat with a guy, and, you know, you, you spank him. And then, you know, people get this crazy idea in their head that somehow you're different. The, yeah, the, that you're not actually a, a human subject to fatigue. Yeah, because you can do all these wonderful things, and and you know they ask you a question, you have the answer. Yeah, and it's like oh, this this guy, he, he's got it, he's got it. In the it's like hang on, it no, it's not like that. We're people. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it is an interesting thing that you run into when you're doing when you when you're in that coaching kind of situation because you can feel it in the students. There, there's this really strong desire in them to put you on a pedestal and to make you infallible, which is a really dangerous place to be. Pedis- pe- people do not belong on pedestals. No, don't man. put them up there and don't be there yourself. Well, cause it's, it's, it's it only, <laughs> it, if the person that you're trying to put up there voluntarily goes, then it's only going to lead to one place, which is, which, which is disappointment. Um, so if, if you're in that coaching role, you've got to be really careful about making sure that you keep your feet on the ground. Um, because sooner or later you're going to have a day where you're not having a great day. At, at this point, I'd just like to say thank you, Saba, because <laughs> yep. the, the, the anchor yeah. that stops me from just drifting off. Yeah. Well, but, and it, it goes back to what we're talking about, how relationships are really important because yeah. a lot of time our partners are not caught up in, in the jiu-jitsu side of things, even though, well, both of our partners train, um, but they still know us well it enough to me, go. It took me 12 years yeah. <laughs> to get Saba on the mat. But and it was her idea, it wasn't mine. Well, there you go. You just, you just let it, <laughs> well, let she it thinks in. it was her idea. Yeah. No, 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 no. It really was her idea. I had um, nothing to do with that. But having someone that knows you well enough to, to basically not buy into, you know, your jiu-jitsu godlike status. And I say that, but I'm, I really mean just in that room that you're in. It's very tongue-in-cheek. It's, well, it is. It's, it's, it's because, you know, know like, it's, it, like, none of us are world champions. No, um, it's more that nope. your, your students revere you and your knowledge and your ability and they constantly look to you for that. And guidance. they want... Everybody wants a hero. Yeah. And so the, you're walking into a market, like regardless of the reasons why people say that they want to train, there's something going on with almost every single person that steps foot in that room where they want to be able to, to be the person who can handle the shit. 
They want to be other person that can slay the metaphorical dragon. You know, they want to be the hero of the story, and they they're looking for for a hero to learn from. Um, so it's it's natural. We we're all doing that. Like, you know, there's and that would all depend on the degree of confidence that people have, and a lot of yep. people come to martial arts because they're searching for it, and that's what that's why I got into it. Uh, me too, and um, the the thing that we often come to understand is and, and you know it, it took me a very long time and i still feel that even now i'm still coming to grips with it although that is a little different now than it mm-hmm. was 15 years ago um the the idea that confidence is something that someone can give you yeah is flawed <laughs> yeah. it's like we We'll say, yeah, we say this all the time. Like Lincoln, Lincoln and I have a bit of a running joke because hyperflow, you can't teach heart. And we're like, this is that's that's what we're fucking doing. Yeah, exactly. That's what we're doing. Like it's, but you're teaching them to to you, you're encouraging them to find that in themselves. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. It's we the process of training, like we were saying earlier, that you know we would try to force that resilience into somebody in one hour where right. now now we allow it to take not yeah, the best it's, method it's a growth. It's <laughs> yeah like anything it's like a callus it, it might take up. someone a year to find it exactly um, but if you provide a, a community a room a culture and a space that encourages people to get better so it's the it's the job of the people above to lift up the people below and then you get better training partners and the whole room elevates but it's it's not we obviously all at some point have come to realize that it's not on our clock. It's not even on the individual's clock. No. It's in their psyche's clock. If Mm. they're around it enough and they're being supported for a long enough time, they will eventually find it. And this is something that I, I had to really check myself with is I was not a patient man. No. Um, by any stretch, um, and and to this day, it's like I, I think having kids is is a good thing. That, that's gonna that's gonna test your patience. <laughs> it does, man. It does. But because even being in 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 a relationship, you know, with a significant other, they're not always going to agree with you, and they will let you know. And but it's also as well they should. Yeah, you know? and it's also that you can't you can't approach relationship problems the same way that you that you might. With jujitsu, which is if I don't have the technical skill, I will just go harder. Right, you can't. You can't defeat it with a battle axe. No, (laughs) you can't. Like it just doesn't work that way. And so it it does. It does teach you. But I mean, those lessons are still still exist on the mat as well because there's there's you run into someone good enough, you can go as hard as you want. It's still not going to work. Yep. Um, But (laughs) yeah, the 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 process that that we kind of end up going through on the mat, it there needs to be space. There needs to be room for for people to be able to find that moment. Where, and it's just a little thing sometimes where they're like, fuck, like that thing where I was quitting last week and I have been for the previous two years, I didn't tonight. That might be the, like the one little thing yeah. that for them starts that, like that's, that's the seed and that's where their confidence starts coming from. That's like, something I think Cam was really, really great at was just getting people just to keep going. Yeah. You can do it. You, you'll make it. Keep going. There needs to be a. a yeah, he, he was he was always really great at that right from the beginning. I was not. I was like, <laughs> and shit happens. Deal with it, you know. Well, I mean, <laughs> you guys, but you guys if I said of, anything at all, but yeah. I think this is one of the reasons why it, it works so well with the three of us because of the the different places that we all sat. And so Cam's by nature is a, is a lot more gentle. Um, back then, I'm talking about how he were back then. Oh, of course. Um, and you are brutal, Dave. Um, oh, and and you know. To be perfectly candid, I did enjoy that. <laughs> yeah, at at that not, time of my life, it was like... Well, I, I, yeah. I would imagine, I, though, that... I, I own that. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine, though, that, that's, that's, that ends up being a response to... I'm not, the, I'm not being bullied. Like, you just have that... Like, like, there's two spaces you can exist in. Being bullied or not being... And right. not being is better, and even if it means that you're doing it to someone else. Right. Yeah. So, and there, there would be a lot of like that sense of like, I have power. Right. It's like it, you've got it, the infinity gauntlet, man. Like, what are you going to do with <laughs> oh, it, dude? Uh, you know, Thanos is a punk. 
Well, um, this is an interesting. <laughs> but but this, as far as I was concerned at that point, <laughs> this this raises an interesting thing, right? Which is, I think one of the things that Jitsu does really well at exposing in people is it's how how do people respond to uh, losing, but how do people respond to winning? And I don't just mean in the in the the, the individual one moment sense, but how do people respond to working their way up through the ranks and becoming one of the top guys in the gym? Because some guys actually don't handle it well. No, that's a little bit like I was saying earlier about when we were starting to learn stuff and that power was intoxicating. It was yeah. like, oh man, I can bust arms and choke people out and shoulders and yep. yeah, and you've, you've got to make sure that that doesn't get away from it you. It does, man. All like, the way through. Yeah, it's, 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 like, it's like the ring in Lord of the Rings, man. Like that's, it, that's what I meant when I said it's like, on as far as skill is concerned met the grade yeah. as far yeah. as maturity was concerned yeah i look back at it now it's like at, at the time you know yeah the belt's always going to be heavy but you you were i wore it with pride but if i looked at it now i'd be like you know what maybe wait a year or two yeah just to even you out a little bit so yeah like i i'm trying to think of um i should know the year but i can never actually remember the year that i got my my black belt i just know that it was two, 2008 years. it was year after me thank you very much um, and we were, I'd heard through the grapevine that both you and I were going to get black belts at that gathering. Mm. Um, and, uh, like, and I can't remember exactly how, or maybe I just don't want to say, it might be the same thing. Um, <laughs> but I ended up saying to Higgin, I'm like, please, no, like I just, not now, like just give me one more year, like just one more year. And part of the reason was, is like, I was younger as well. Um, and I didn't feel like I was ready for it. Um, I don't think you ever do really feel like you're ready for it um, because in in your head, you've got this idea of what a black belt is and part of it's mythical and you can't possibly be that. Um, so there's like no matter where you're at, you, you, just, you know, unless you are one of the super freaks out there and they're there for if, like one of those guys that just goes into black belt division, just runs through everyone. But those guys are, they're the exception. Um, but for, for mere mortals, like it's, you'd never feel like you're quite enough. Yeah. Um, that also comes from the, the training that we had too. There was always more. Yes. And I think that also taps into that part where you were talking about shoot fighting and people being drawn over to BJJ where there's only, I suppose, there's only so many times people go, oh, oh you know, jab, cross, hook, I've got it. Yeah. Now, I find, an, you know, a real technician will understand there's a lot more to do. But from a layman turn, they go, well, I can throw a cross. Oh, I can do a hook. I can and, do this. And the pad makes a nice crack when yeah, I hit and, it. And, and it's good. And to yeah. the student, there seems to be, uh, you know, the, the, the law of diminishing returns. And that no longer becomes enticing. Yeah. But when then you move over to jiu-jitsu, well, there are some rabbit holes you can go down and they are deep. It's and deep. They can, and yeah, the, and, 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 and you can never come out Well, that's exactly <laughs> it. And, it, and, it, and like we're saying, it never ends. There's always more to learn. And the when scene, the scene it. changes around you yeah. as well. So like jujitsu is is very dynamic. It's moving a lot. So you know, for a while it was just IBJJF. If you wanted to compete, they're the rules. And then you see this sub only stuff coming up, and all these other variations, which are fantastic. It's really good that they all the different ones exist. Um, it's it, the, the scene is moving a lot, mm. um, which is really really good because again, it keeps you honest. But it makes it very hard if you like the idea of gathering some knowledge, and once you have got that knowledge, it's all good and you have it. Because it, it doesn't like so traditional martial arts where you learn your kata and it stays the same, like like karate is tradi- that. So some people find that really appealing because you get to a certain point and it becomes a lot less stressful because you've already got it, and that that thing that you've got it's not going to change on you. But in jiu-jitsu, like you have to, that, it's like you have to go for your driver's test every year. Yeah, you know. But the roads rules are changing and the cars changing, and you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're not if you're not engaged, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be on the mat rolling every day or even competing every day. I'm not suggesting that, but you need to be engaged. So you need to have your brain on the mat. So if you can't physically be the one rolling, uh, then I'd, I'll use Danaher as an example because he's he's mangled and he can't roll, from what I understand. But because he's on the floor watching his guys and they're out there doing the stuff, they're getting the feedback on the systems yeah. all the time. So it's like he's coming up with this idea or this this. You know, system, and then those guys go out there and they pressure test it, and they they bring the data back, and then the tweet, and then so there has to be some process of that happening. There's a science to it. Otherwise, you're going to get left behind. Yeah. Well, there's there's always the, the it's the finger on the pulse, and and this was something that is sort of interesting that you you bring up. Now it's it's getting to a point where the specialization. I mean, uh, when we would have started. 
and it was sort of changing around that time. So around sort of 98, mm-hmm. 97, 98, it started to change. It started to shift. Basically, I, I just remember jujitsu was the thing that you did when you wanted to bash everybody else. Yeah. And there was no such thing as gi, no gi, MMA, this rule set, that rule set. That didn't exist. Mm-hmm. It was, this is jujitsu. And sometimes you could be, remember, like, no yeah. gi training was take your gi top off. Yeah, that's yeah. It, yeah. And that was it. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, we're going to do some we're going to do some punching. One guy puts gloves on, the other guy's yep. in the garden. He's going to try and punch the snot out of you and you're going to survive it or mm-hmm. not. Right. That's <laughs> yeah. So like, and, and that was the thing as, as things starts to change, the one thing I noticed was I did not have any particular ability that was great. Yeah. So I did not have like, you know, you talk about, we were talking about Tyron Cross before mm-hmm. with, with the chokes. It's like, arm locks Mm -hmm. right (laughs) triangles um i never had that but i think the strength that i ended up playing towards was my ability to find patterns and common ground between a lot of stuff Mm -hmm. so you have to find a way to evolve in the evolution on your own you do you you have to find something to anchor yourself to there's a there's a point you gotta operate from that you that you use to to, it's your home base, right? Mm. That you that you use to understand things from, and then you can you can work from there. Um, I think one of the things, like if we look at jiu-jitsu, it roughly falls into three categories. So you've got sport jiu-jitsu, and that subcategories of IBJF, no gi, and sub only. So gi, IBJF rules, no gi, IBJF rules, and then sub only, which might have time limits, might could, not. You could even break it down to even weight divisions. You can, yeah, yeah, because like it, it does like vary. Specialization in but, that. Those sport categories, like, so there's three kind of like generalized kind of categories of sport jiu jitsu. Then you've got self defense jiu jitsu, and then you've got jiu jitsu for MMA. Um, I think that broadly you could say those three sport, self defense, MMA. It's pretty fair. Um, now, there's a lot of people out there that, when we're talking about like older Brazilian guys, um, some of the, I can't remember who it was, there's one of the Graces that was having a bitch and a moan about, how if you're not doing self-defense, you're not doing jiu-jitsu, which is fucking horse shit, um, in my opinion. But it's not that any one of those three is the path. They're all fine. And anyone can, to, can choose to engage in jiu-jitsu how they want. And it's all good. So it's not for me to say that if these guys over here are not doing jiu-jitsu that works for MMA, then they're not doing it. Or if these guys over here are, are not doing sport jiu-jitsu, then it's not... They're all fine. They're all good. And you can you can choose to, to practice it as a student how you want. And you can choose as a coach to run a gym, focus on any one of those that you want. And it's fine. It, it's not locked in. And that's one of the cool things about it. Like it's, it, regardless of which of those three that you're working in, it's always evolving. It's always changing. It's always getting better. I, I would add something else as a little bit of a noodle bender, which is something that I've been thinking about quite a lot. Um, I, I was at the time I was a lot more, you know, I'm, I was searching mm. for more knowledge about the self-defense elements, the stuff that wasn't being practiced very widely. Mm-hmm. So then eventually you sort of get labeled as the guy for whatever. Yeah. Um, and I happen to wear that label. You do, yeah. And the funny thing about the evolution of it for me is I actually don't really operate in any of those three but i operate in all of them yeah that's but that's part of it like you can be in all of them you don't have to just be in one you can be in but the point that i was trying to make though is there's guys out there that 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 believe that this is the way that jiu-jitsu has to be right and it's not it's not at all have you heard that though we don't do it like that we do it like this now yeah jiu-jitsu is the master of martial arts it is it will take a little bit of this it'll take a little bit of that It'll, it'll absorb it, it'll make it, and it'll make it a part of its own. You guys remember when 10th Planet came onto the scene and, and everyone was like, they don't train in the gi, so it's not real jiu-jitsu? Uh, that sad. was a thing for a while. Like, like, yeah, try, are, try floating that argument now. Yeah. So yeah. What, 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 have we, what have we done with jiu-jitsu in the sense of taking in wrestling? So you've got your double legs and your takedowns like that. Taking in judo as well, even though yeah, we came from judo to be with. Even there was a point where triangles weren't practiced in jiu-jitsu. 
and then they were introduced. Well, well things so this thing that, is they fall in and out of vogue too. Yeah, yeah, and yeah the, true. The yes. history is murky, yeah, uh, and I think right. that's one of the things that that Drysdale's got a documentary coming out on yeah, the Origins too soon, to and that. and there's a bunch of things in that we we have conversations regular about some of the stuff that he's been researching and finding, and there's there's a bit of yeah, there's a little bit of misinformation and and yeah. say. Propaganda oh, look, that's been going history, on about the history of jiu jitsu. History has okay. been written by the winners. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, but as far as all of that stuff is concerned, I, I would I would expand on what you were saying, and I would say that jiu jitsu is for humans. Yeah, but practiced by individuals, mm-hmm. and there is no getting around being a human. But as an individual. You can take it to a lot of different places, yeah. yeah. And I and I think that the the, the arguments and, and and I've chosen to opt out of 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 late to opt out of that argument of which is better. I, I actually think the argument itself collapses when you look at it from a technique centric standpoint. It's like, well, this guy is not going to do this, so why would I practice that? As opposed to, I'm going to run into this in this situation, mm-hmm. so I'll practice this. If you look at it from a technique centric standpoint, you could make those comparisons all day long. Mm-hmm. If I were to look at it from a conceptual standpoint, none of that matters. Yeah. You don't get to opt out of being a human. You cannot opt out of being uh, subject to physics. Yeah. It is what it is. The, yeah, yeah. The, the mechanics exist the same way for everyone. I think the most important thing is that you find the way to engage in it that keeps you on the mat. Correct. Yeah. Um, and that's going to change with time. Sure does. As, as, as you, you know, guys in our 20s, we want to compete, we want to butt heads and all that sort of stuff. But if you're not that guy, you can still do it. Yeah. Yep. Well, I mean, uh, if we look at the, the bulk of like, I compete a lot, Link competes a lot, Muzz is back to competing. Um, I've got a crew of guys. So look, look out. I got a crew of guys who compete, <laughs> but the bulk of the guys do not. Right. So the space has to function to allow recreational guys to to be able to succeed and to be able to grow in it, and they need to be an important part of the team, um, and they are. So having a really good bunch of recreational Everyone's guys still contributing, yeah. So it's there's there's definitely some benefits to having some people competing. Um, oh, I agree. But you you. Yeah, you, you probably want to be careful about having a room that's only got competitors in it. But then well, you then just you exclude people, don't you? I well, mean, then you then you're dealing with a lot of egos too. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that 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 you know there's there's this evolution that we go through as 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 students and because while we're coaches, we're still students too, and it's, yeah. I think it's it's one of the few things that you can do where you can be both at the same time. You have to be both at the same time because the moment you stop being a student, you start to become a fairly average coach. Um, you're, you're headed backwards. Exactly, right? It's yeah. not static. Um, and yeah, that, that process is like we're constantly evolving, changing. The businesses are constantly evolving and changing as well depending on where we're at. And you know, for, for Donuts now, it's been 18 years. So I've been around a long time. Yeah. So it's like it's, it's safe to say that in terms of a business, it's a black belt business right now. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it's it's definitely maturing. Like, yeah, where we got to Victoria Street, um, and it had kind of like like it had grown to this thing, and it was a massive jump. And I don't think we realized how big of an, a, a jump it was going to be. Yeah, for and then sure. we, I, I, I think, I assume for you because I know it was for me. There was actually a little bit of shell shock with it. We were like. Like, in theory, this is all great. And then when we get there, we're like, holy fuck. Oh, we, I think we jumped on a treadmill. We didn't realize how fast that we had to run. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was it, you know. Like, yeah, holy crap, it was a good a, idea. In, in, it's a really good way of putting it. And, yeah. it's, and I don't mean by any stretch that we made the, the wrong decision because I think what we did was, oh. ex, was exactly the right decision for the moment. Um, Pressure and diamonds. Where we wanted to go and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I don't think we realized because it wasn't, it wasn't just like we're going from one mats to two mats. It's double. It was like three or four times the the um the the workload yeah um the demand on front of house coaching the overheads yes it um, was it was several orders of magnitude yeah it was greater. significantly bigger and i would um, i would always use the analogy that it's kind of like pumping up a balloon with holes in it yeah you just got to keep going because yeah. as soon as you stop yeah sh- it's gonna start you're gonna keep going again you just got to keep pumping yeah. that thing. yeah and it, there was a there was a point through that 
Um, there was somewhere along the line, and I, this goes back to kind of what happened to the three of us earlier, where yeah. where because of the the dynamic that we had, um, we realized that things were not that things with you and I, like because we've always been super close friends, mm. uh, and there was a, there was a point that we got to where we we're like we're not hanging out as mates anymore. We're not really enjoying our time in the gym together at all. Like it was like like yeah. kind of ships passing in the night and we went, fuck, something's, something's going on here. And we, I remember we sat down and had a conversation about it and you're like, man, it's just, I just don't, I, I don't want to be doing it the same way that you want to do it anymore. And, I, and that was the point where we're like, all right, we've got to do some, we've got to change. Something has to, something has to be different. Because yeah. if we keep going in this direction, we're just going to end up burning it around, burning it down around us. Oh. So we don't have the problem anymore. Yeah, it was that, it, like you were saying earlier, it was that kind of that slow diverging and then you wanted to, it ended up being, you wanted to pull it in a direction and I didn't quite want to go in that direction. So that you I, had, you I had think start, the renovations were on the card then yeah, as well. And, you, and, and what happened is then you actually had to not only start pulling the business in that direction or the gym, but also pulling me. Yeah, and that's where that was. Yeah, that was like because we we're talking about time as because well, like it went from ten hours to forty hours, oh, and yeah. Yeah. and you know there's other responsibilities and things that were important, and you know there was that kind of thing where I was like, like we need to be in more, man. And you're like, I don't really want to be putting that kind of time in it. And they eventually were like, all right, well we need to do different things. And we talked about it, like, like who wants to stay and who wants to go, and it seemed like a, a fairly natural choice. And then we yeah. figured out the details around that, and that allowed us to actually get back to things being really good so the friendship got really good uh it got back to what it was and it allowed us to be in the space the way that we wanted to because you've always still been training in the gym and we we get together and cross train the gyms yep. are very closely connected yeah is um, it, isn't it funny how like anytime something like this happens so you know someone leaves a business someone joins a business someone, yeah you know wants to pull it this way and, and whatever and then that chatter that actually goes out that is very rarely if ever confirmed there was a schism there was a problem there mm. was this there was that. it's like no it's not like that no, no. It, it, and it's really no one else's business no. but but people will people will talk because people, talk. people always want to think one the worst two make it controversial and it was none and then, of those and, and it's and when it gets back to the people that it ultimately concerned yeah. it's always very negative yeah right? exactly it wasn't like oh they're 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 the best of mates but they just had they just were starting to drift apart and but that's boring well yeah, exactly. it is yeah. <laughs> and, it is. and we put out we put our friendship before the business which how many times do you hear business owners that were friends mm. and end up going they put the business first and the friendship second and then they lose both yeah so it was always very we, conscious of we that. We had pretty candid chats about the whole thing, though, as yeah. it was happening. When we realized what was going on, yeah. then we started speaking about it fairly openly. And that made a fairly big difference because we're like, all right, cool, we know what's happening. So we know what the course forward is. Like, we either have to change what the what dominance is or one of us has to leave. Yeah. Uh, and so then we talked about, well, like, who's the best one to stay? And in hindsight, that's obvious. Uh, yeah. And it wasn't what either of us wanted to do was wrong. It's just that we, again, that one degree over time, because it was 10 years. So mm. we're in it together for about two and a half years and we're in it together for 10 years. Mm. So if you look back on that, that's actually really fucking successful, yeah. uh, that outcome. Like to, to really successfully run a business and grow it for 10 years and the business is still here and now you've started another thing that's also really successful. You've started another thing that's really successful. There's no failures in any of that. And, and the funny thing is you get three guys in a room, all of which are in possession of their own skill set, their own personalities to have them in the same room involved in the same business for about two minutes is always yeah. challenging. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and at the time as well, we're, we're both like the, like all three of us, not actually, not just us. So you, you think about John Simon, you think about Mars, you think about all these other guys that are involved in it. Everyone's a very strong personality type and everyone was yeah. really, really and, hungry to succeed. And all killers. Yeah, like <laughs> and, exactly. And everyone's trying to beat the cheese out of each other. And, and any given day, like one of those one of those different guys might be might be the top dog that day. Um, and it's really interesting that that, that that worked and that allowed people to, to kind of come through uh, and remain connected and the, and the relationships stay intact. Um, but yeah, like that, I can't remember exactly what, what, eight years ago. Um, so it was, yeah, cause we were, it was, it was we were working our way through ADCC and it was after ADCC that yeah. we, yeah. Shit, I didn't realize that. Yeah. So, so yeah. cause like you were saying about, 
about asking more, being in the more. I was I was doing the lunch classes, so yep. I'd be in there at eleven. Yeah. To then get ready for twelve o'clock, and then I'd stay all afternoon. Then I'd want to train, but also train and teach and be a yeah. part of it all. So I wasn't getting out of there till nine nine thirty. Yeah. So that's why it was like ten hour days. Yeah, yeah. All the time, and then it was like need yeah. More it's part of it as well, is because you lived across the other side of town too, and I was yeah. I always made a point of I live close to the gym. Literally across the road at one stage. Yeah, <laughs> literally, and it was because yeah. like man, I don't I don't want to I don't want to waste time sitting in a car. Like I want to be able to just go back and forth, and yeah. so but. You know, but my, like, mine was more of a lifestyle move. Well, as it was well. too, man. Like, yeah, I, I understand now. I've I've got a kid and I've got a dog. Yeah. Um, so you kind of get it. Um, now I live a massive fifteen minutes from the gym, but, uh, yeah, it's interesting being able to recognize those points. Like, if we we look back on the timelines, you can see the really clear points of of uh, like the fork in the road of like, man, if we kept going forward, the whole thing would have ended up. But it would it would have undone a lot of stuff. Now it might not necessarily have destroyed it but it would have done a lot of damage. I think one thing I remember you saying to me was, if you want dominance, have it. My fear is it will shrink down to the size that you want it to be. Yeah. It won't be what it was. It'll be that. And I'm like, and I already knew, like, yeah, it will be. Yeah. So that was why I was like, which way are we going to go? Well, you've got the drive and the desire to continue it at this size and take it beyond that if that's what you chose yeah where i didn't have i'm a pretty kind of not, not low energy but i'm a i'm a lower energy guy than you and so my and being more introverted my yeah my ability to keep going for that was like no nah, that's not where i wanted to be no and there's there's it's totally fine like i've got yeah three gyms now and they're all at slightly different sizes so uh and this is the fourth uh space that it's been in Um, yeah yeah, and so having experienced all the different sizes that a gym can be there's pros and cons for all of them there's definitely pros and cons for all of them um but and because we have the addition of Muay Thai and MMA as well it increases the responsibilities because then you get into the space of managing people um and that's a whole nother thing but when you're just doing jiu-jitsu and let's say that you keep to say lunches and evenings you can run all the jiu-jitsu classes yourself. Um, and the front of house is a, is a lot a uh, lot more chill because you don't have um, as many front of house staff. You might have one. Um, and it may be your partner that runs your front of house. I don't know if Sab- is Sabah involved in the business? Sabah is. Uh, actually, she... She runs some of the jiu-jitsu courses too, right? She does. Uh, she's the only uh, woman in Australia to have become a fully certified instructor under Grace University. Oh, that's pretty cool. cool. Um, right. for they've got for, a women empowerment course, right? Um, they ha- is that what it's called? She, she's with that as well. Yes. So she went through the regular instructor ICP and then did the women empowerment. Yeah. Oh, I guess what I was also. getting for is, does she run that course here? Or yes. Something? Yeah. There you go. Um, a, a, as far as our academy is concerned, um, she has the the uh, ownership of certain programs like mm-hmm. the Bullyproof and the Women Empowered. I take care of the rest, but we have two front of house staff yep. um, that help us out tremendously with that. Yep. Um, and, and I would have to say that it's like knowing what I know now, I, I went from trying to do everything myself to a point where I almost walked away. Yep. In, I know exactly tw- what I mean. in 2015, I was, I had just finished a training trip to Brazil and I got back home and I was just like, not really sure if I want to continue. Mm. And that was not a good space to be in in for me. Mm. Um, so anyway, but thankfully, things got sorted out. But um, I was having a discussion with a, a very cool guy, his name is Stephen White. And he was talking to us about systems and having them in place. And mm-hmm. he was looking at my numbers, he goes, what systems are you on? I said, uh, what are you talking about? Uh, what software do you have? Like, mm-hmm. how many staff do you have? I said, um, I don't. And he just looked at me like I had two heads. He mm-hmm. goes, you got to this number doing this by yourself, by hand. Yep. I said, oh, look, I got help. He goes, I refer you to my previous statement. <laughs> 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 yep. Um, and it was that was the one thing. So when we started improving that, mm. um, things just started to, to grow and, and all that sort of stuff. And it was it was a lot less stressful. Yeah, I think it's really important for people to understand that what we're doing, although our passion is on being on the mat, passing across jiu-jitsu, engaging in all that sort of stuff, 
you can't ignore the, the business side of the business because like if and you don't okay manage it, it's going to manage you yeah. in a bad it's way. Okay to delegate, you got to have do to, it. man. And that's to. what that's that's I was not good at that. Yeah, you guys know me well enough to know that I, I was not good at that. Not no, in no. a very specific way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, but it's you know part of the reason why we ended up being successful with things is because of that innate um, drive. To just you just grab hold of stuff and you figure it out and you do it. Yeah. Um, and it that quite often means you end up taking all these things on board and you not being very willing to let other people do it because they'll maybe fuck it up. Well, and, and then because we take so much pride in stuff, the fear of someone else messing it up. It's our space, man. This is what we've what, what dedicated so, our lives it to. It means so much. Yeah. But ultimately, you just got to sort of sometimes, you know, just detach and go, you know what? If it were to all end right now, I'd still be me. Yeah. I think, <laughs> I think one of the easiest ways to think about it when you're looking at what's going on in the business. So let's say that you stretch too thin, right? There's like, there's, there's 15 units of stuff that need to be done and you've only got 10 units to spend. Um, if you look at what, what skills that you have that are irreplaceable or that no one else in the space can do it as well as you, then it becomes really clear what the decision is. Like the person that's working in front of house can't teach the classes. Yep. <laughs> So it's, it's real easy, right? What do you do? Do you be the front of house person or you teach the club? So it's a no-brainer. You replace the things that can be replaced. Uh, and the reality is, is you could actually find someone, train them up and get them better at that job than you are currently right now in a short space of time. Which is ultimately what took place. Yeah. And i got to say, it's one of the smartest things I ever did. So yep. anyone that's listening to that, um, just a, a little bit of background on myself, when I started sort of branching out on my own and I started teaching my garage. Yep. And then I ended up in renting some space from two different martial arts schools. Mm -hmm. And, and then I was sort of, I felt like I was getting jerked around. So out of spite, I went and found a warehouse space mm -hmm. in Bayswater. Um, that is not the best way to start anything <laughs> when you're angry. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> this is garbage. That's it. I'm doing this. Yep. So maxed out every credit card I had. Like, you know, this was all the lease documents and stuff mm -hmm. came through two weeks before I got married. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. So I, yeah, that's I, intense. I, I spent all my money on mats. Lucky we yep. prepaid for the honeymoon. <laughs> yeah. Because I had nothing. <laughs> and then the first month rolls around, I got to pay rent. I got three students signed up. I'm like, okay, well, time to move forward. Let's go. Yep. And, and it was just, it was out of just, it, that's when you find out that, you know, you can be good at stuff, but you can't afford to go in thinking that you know everything. No, absolutely not. I, I've been around gyms like a, a lot of my, a lot of my life. Um, but really, I, I, I came very close to just falling off the edge and becoming nothing. Yeah. Um, and it was just, like I said, good luck more than good management and just straight up stubbornness that got me over the line. Yeah. Um, the, and you guys did it smart and I'm catching up. <laughs> it, was, it, it was, it was fortunate again. Like just, it's just good fortune that the job that I happened to have for a year set things up, mm. um, for being able to run the, the business side of the business well. And then yeah, I was more of a boots on the ground kind of for accounting. Yeah. Um, I think the, this raises a point, which is uh, that you can be an amazing jiu-jitsu coach, but if you don't know how to run your business, you're not going to have many students. Uh, that I, I could not agree with that more strongly. I was always a boots on the ground kind of guy. Yeah. Um, even when we were together, it was, it was very much the same. I'll do, I'll do the grunt work. Yeah. I'll, I'll clean the mat. I'll, I'll do all that stuff. That's cool. But what I failed to extract at the time was the things that I had to learn later on. Yeah. And it's either you learn them and you apply them or you fail. It, That's how it's going to be. And again, it's one of those things where some of the lessons you can't learn them until you have no choice. Yeah. So you're in there and you're right. doing it yourself and then you just, you've got to get armbarred, man. Like we can sit there and tell you a million times, keep your arms up. But you're just not going to until you get armbarred. It, it won't mean anything. To yeah. So finally you're in your own it? space and you're like fucking sales. What? Like what? Like, and we don't like to, some people don't even like to talk about it, but the reality is if you're not signing up students, you're not keeping your doors open. But then there's that stigma with martial arts. So it's like you're, you're selling out. You know, 
if you've got guys on your mat, your mat is going to be strong. Yep. You're going to have a strong mat. If, if you had a, an idea to create the best competition team in the world, you need bodies. Yep. You need people. And every one of those people, regardless of whether or not they are on your star competition team, they need to be there. Yeah. And you got to look after them and you got to train them just as diligently as you would the guys that are out there winning medals and all that sort of stuff. You have to do it. I think it's, it's really simple. You create a space that people really want to be and then you make sure that people know about the space, yeah. which is your marketing, your trial lesson, and then your culture, your team. You could, like, there's a lot of things that, that, that make up a, a place that people want to be or a space that people want to be. Um, and it could be competition team, it could be recreational, it could be whatever the version is of jiu-jitsu that you're engaging, it could be all three. But you do what you need to do to make sure that when people walk on the mat, they're like, fuck yeah, this is an awesome place to be. And there's the community and the culture around that. And, and that's as simple as having front of house stuff that smile when you walk in. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. All those little things. And sometimes if you're the guy that's doing the front of house, so someone walks in for a trial and you're, you've, you're having to pull yourself away from a role and maybe Big Doug just leg locks you and you're pissed off, it's, it's not going to be well. <laughs> it's not going to be the best conversation with that person that just walks in the door. But uh, yeah, it's it, the the idea that we always kind of have here that we always operate from is that we want to make sure that we maximize our exposure, so we choose the right people for the team. You don't want to be in a situation where you're running a gym that you're so desperate to pay your bills that you will take anybody that walks through the door, even if they're not good for you. Because yeah. it's, it is a two-way street. People might think that you'll take anyone that walks in, but it's not true. Not we, we turn people away regularly. Now, when I say regular, I don't mean one person a week. But there's always some people that... Most of the time, they don't even make it through the phone call. The, the culture does that, though. The culture that's will the, do it. That's the filter The process. systems will do it for you as well, right? You've yeah. got a way that people speak on the phone and, and work through that process, the questions they ask and what they're trying to find out about someone. And you'll find out, figure out very quickly whether or not someone fits. Uh, and you can kind of manage them out there. But every now and again, someone will make it through into a trial lesson. And then we're like, you know, the guys in the front of the house, the coach I mean, will we'll be like, we're all on the same page, right? Like, yeah, cool. Like, let's move them along. And it might not be that they're bad, that that person's bad. They're usually not. It's usually not that they're, that they're a bad person. That's very but, rarely, if ever, the case. No, very rare. But it's just that they just don't fit. And there's somewhere else where they might fit. And we'll very happily go, you know what? Like, what you want, is not like that's not what we're doing here. We'll share the love, and yeah, and we're happy to refer you. Yeah, exactly. Like if someone came into me and they and they were like, "Man, I'm a I'm like 75 kilos lighter MMA guy, and I I want to fight professionally." Sweet, awesome. If someone came in and like, "I'm 100 kilos and I'm a pro MMA fight," I'm like, "Go see Dan Kelly." They get like, "We're just not gonna have the training partners for you in that." Like our our MMA, MMA team is the lighter four or five weight classes. And that's what we focus on. Right. So, but I, but I know that about what we do. So I'm not... And you're also honest about that too. Well, it, it helps. But John Will was also particular about that. He's like, like, not, like know what you are. Yeah. Know what you're offering. And don't, you know, the old jack of all trades, master of none. You don't want to be that in a, in a gym and coaching sense. But it also comes down to as simply as if you work in their best interest, whether they're, they're a science student or not, you're always going to leave... You're going to always have good credit I mean, I had a conversation with a, a lady the other day, called me and I said, okay, where are you based? She goes, I'm in Pasco Vale. And I'm like, oh, we're, we're a little way away. There's plenty of good... Mm. And I said to her, look, don't get me wrong. I'd love to have you as a student, but practically I want to make sure that this works for you. Yeah. And I think I said, and, uh, and she's like, no, no, I'm happy to drive the 20 minutes. And I'm like, okay, no problem. And... I booked her in and then I went to do the confirmation. She's like, oh, look, I found somewhere else. It's a little bit closer. I think I'm going to go, great, no problem at all. Yep. So it's always working in their best interest to go, love to have you, yeah. but the only, this can only end in disappointment, whether it's a cultural thing or it's a goal-setting thing yeah. or it's even a geographical thing. Well, that, that's something that John always um, was always very big on. John Will was always very big on, was acting with integrity. Yeah. And... And doing that, you, you could have just as easily, you know, yeah. if, if you weren't acting in their best interest, if you did not have that integrity, it would have been easy to try and, you know, use your acquired sales skills. So, no, 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 just come and hang out with us and exactly, we'll yeah. show you. It's like, oh, no, you got to do what's right for you. It's yeah. not personal. It's just hey, you, you got to do what's worked for them. But and you know what? Who knows? 10 years from now, mm -hmm. that person moves 15 minutes the other way. Yeah. And, and they come to you and they, and they remember that conversation. Yeah. They go... Hey, and that's something, once again, I learned far too late. 
I, I, you know, I, I, I had a particular code that I live by, but I was expecting and making assumptions too much. Mm. And it, it turned out that I ended up burning some bridges there, which really, you know, didn't need to go that way. And, yeah. and it's regrettable, but you learn it as you go. And, I, and I think, I think we've, well, I know I've had that experience of, as well as like, I, I'm willing to travel. Like it's like, I train with John. And if John's here and like I'm in that group, I train the hand, you know, that connection, like if it's an hour each way, that's what I do. Um, and I thought it was unreasonable that not everybody thought that way. And so when well, I had we were people, willing to do that. Yeah. And but that's what I mean. It's like not everybody know. is. And, and you know, when we start the gym and then some people end up going like, ah, oh, you know what? Like I'm going to go train here because it's a bit closer. And I was like, fuck you. Not saying those words, but in my head, I'm like, you fucking serious. And it's, and it's, and it is personal because you did, it was put some time or we took it personally because yeah. you did put time and effort into that person and then yeah. to have them go oh, i'm gonna go train with this guy now and then there was that there was that different vibe too i think the vibe between academies is changing as well it's much more open now it's much more relaxed like back in the day it's like there was no cross if training you, if you no. if you jump teams that yeah. was a big deal you were kind of blacklisted a little bit which again is a testament to john from your experience of going and and you know trying things at JD's and like, this isn't for me. And then speaking to John and then John, like, of course, like, well, once again, the honesty counts. You did it the right way. Yeah. And that's, that's something I can, I can thank my dad for. Yep. It's like you, whatever you do, you act with integrity. It should be. Like, be I think the default with that is like honest to your own detriment. So, and usually, yeah. and usually, like, yeah, I think the easiest, the easiest way to approach that kind of thing is um, if you've got a hard decision to make, the one that the thing that you don't want to do is the right thing to do. Yep. I can't think of an occasion in my life when that the has right, not right been the case. Right, right is very rarely, if ever, easy. <laughs> yes. Of course. And like the only reason you're wrestling with it is because uh, this other thing would be better for me in some way, but I should be doing this. You know, but it's 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 tempting because it's easy, but that's the really only temptation there. Yeah. It's because it's easier. Yeah. Yeah. And we say it all the time that easy is not better, uh, and, it, and it really is. But uh, it's like all these kind of things that we're talking around, like these, the, we're talking about kind of ideas of, or philosophies or approaches and the way that the spaces exist and they, they you know, kind of help shape us in our, in our personal journey. But I think one of the things that's a really kind of common, common thread through this whole thing is that although our own journeys have, have gone a lot of different ways, um, we've still like you and I don't see each other as much as Cam and I do, but we've always still maintained contact. Um, and oh, when you, when you, when you, I got the message, hey, I want to talk with you two Muppets, you know. <laughs> I'm like, count me in. You know? Yeah. Well, I think that's the point, isn't it? It's whenever we see each other, there's smiles. Yeah. And whenever we communicate, there's smiles. There's goodness. There's there was, there was part, we, we spent too much time beating the snot out of each other <laughs> and, and, and going through all that. Yeah. And even being at a point where sometimes, of course, we're going to disagree on things and all that sort of stuff. But it was always a situation where, okay, let's 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 get down to this. We can yeah. be candid with each other. We don't we don't need to, you know, put any sugar coating on it. Let's no. just be straight. And, you know, that's something that I I do very much try to take into every relationship I have with anyone. Yeah, um, and, that, and that was a, a huge learning curve for me, particularly at that point in time. Yes, you can be tried as an adult um, when you're in your 20s, but mm. you're really not. I mean, <laughs> no, and I, was, I was having this exact thought the other day, actually, about this idea of what we consider to be an adult. And it changes for different people. People reach it at different points. But, man, you'd struggle even in your mid-20s to be, to be what I would consider to be mature enough. They, now the context is really easy for me. To be mature enough to be able to parent. Um, and I'm, I don't mean by I, any stretch to say that that's the end all be all, but I, I, Saba's saving the day on that one. Well, yeah. <laughs> She's carrying the load there, mate. Man, I, I don't disagree, but it's um, about my partner, not yes, so you and Saba. But um, uh, if I think back to how I was when I was 25 and imagine trying to be a, a good parent, I was like, no fucking way in the world. Um, but interestingly enough, we were coaching at that age. We're, we're doing some mini parenting at that age. We're, we're responsible yeah. for people's safety. Yeah. They're putting, they walked in not knowing what the capacity to be injured was. Yeah. 
And, and we were and we yeah. were managing that. <laughs> well, we came you know, pretty well. They came, I, they came to us for answers. Tell us what to do and how to do it. Okay. And, <laughs> and honestly, you know, I think I think we did a pretty good job considering. Um, yeah. They and in a lot of ways, we were ahead of the curve with a lot of things that we were doing. And and one of the things was even though the culture in the space was train you train hard and and you don't take the easy way out. Um, we were never we were never malicious, we, and there were surprisingly very very few injuries as well. Considering, well, when, I can't when, think of any major ones at all. And, and the, I would say the litmus test for a malicious injury would be one that occurs in a submission. Yeah. So there's obviously pride, some recklessness, and possibly ignorance involved in that, but the system of having a beginner's class and you yeah. graduate to this class sort of takes out the ignorance factor. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, there's, there's pride and there's recklessness, but, you know, how reckless could you really be when everyone realized what was at stake? Yeah. And that was instilled at the beginning. Yes. So that, that took care of a lot of it. So when, when you have a malicious injury, it's like, okay, someone just didn't let go. Mm-hmm. The injuries that were inevitable, particularly when you're training at that pace and that intensity as regularly as we were yeah uh, and we moderate that now we we understand it's like hey you can't go flat out all the time uh, we have we have a comp session for that right so you have so one you, hard hit you, out a week you moderate it but the rest of the time you got to be able to explore back then that was not moderated no it was okay we're rolling and that's how it's going to be the injuries happen in transition mm. they, they weren't yeah. based on submission so it was like oh man and and the reaction from those people was like oh okay we've got to help the guy right away yeah and that that was always a part of it. So as as, and we look back at it, and I even say to my students, it's like I'm not sure if you would have liked it back in the day. You know, it's it's very different now. Yeah. But even with all of that going on, it was always a situation where you know the team came first, mm-hmm. and we had to look after. We're, we're only as good as the guys we got to train with. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's it it's great to be able to actually to look back on all in hindsight. It's really good to be able to sit on the couch and talk about. Because we have never actually sat down and talked about the history, the three of us together, and really kind of gone through well, it. Because it kind of just happens, right? Yeah. And then and then stuff's going on, and you like see each other at a seminar. Like, just, hey man, how you doing? Just Eighteen wife. years later, we're yeah. going. We did some stuff. We did, and that there's a lot, of, <laughs> there, and there's so much stuff that we didn't even talk about. I mean, the first part of this, we were shooting, shooting the shit about some cool stories, and the second part, we kind of more got into, you know, the, I guess the that, philosophical element, yeah, uh, which is great because I think it's important for for particular students who might be listening to this to understand a little bit more about how we got to where we are. And cause a lot of them walk in and they go black belts and they just kind of, they, they can't imagine us as anything but that. But to know that once upon a time we were 20 year old fuckheads <laughs> that we're just like, we're, we're trying to figure things out and didn't necessarily get it all right. And, and we, we popped through the other side. Okay. But there were some moments in there where it was like, oof, got away with that somehow. That's that's, that was the awesome thing about being a little kid in the eighties. Yeah. Yeah, you, know, the, you were encouraged to do like you rode bikes without helmets. You didn't do any of that stuff. You made jumps out of, out of milk crates and yeah, all that sort of thing. And and getting into a fight at school was not really that big of a deal. Um, no, you wouldn't get expelled for it, right? Um, you know, I think things times times were different then, and I think you know the 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 expectations of a martial arts school through yeah. that era was it was something that and and it was often. You know, particularly um, going through the sort of the kickboxing gym mm. route, it was often uh, associated with bad guys. Yeah, it was associated with gangsters and underworld. Because well, unfortunately, there was some of those guys in it. It was definitely exactly. a baptism of fire that you yep. had to survive. But I think that as you become smarter, not only in your jujitsu but also being able to run an academy, you had to then broaden the appeal. Yeah, to then be able to. Because what's the best thing we, we want everyone doing jujitsu? Yeah. So how do you? That then, was the only thing we had. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly, and we wanted to share that. So then, how do you make it to the point or accessible to as many people as yeah. possible? Well, you got to change your modality. You got to make it a real beach entry. You can't yeah. just throw them in and then start pelting them with rocks. You know, yeah. <laughs> and that's what we did back in those. And, then, well, and like still, all mature, mature man, things. it still is the way as well. Like even though there's there's a lot more gyms around than there was before. That the pie is still not fully tapped out. Like we don't need to be fighting over the same students. No. Um, people should be should be able to find the the, the right gym for them. Yeah, exactly. Um, and 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 I think by setting 
the examples that you guys have and getting that ball rolling back then where dominance became a benchmark. Whereas like this is what, if, if you want to open a gym and you want to, and you want to be successful and you want to have all those things, which we assume that you're not going to get into it if you don't want to be, mm. you're going to have to at least get to there. Yeah. And it, it raised the bar with reference to how people are treated in the gym. It's not yeah. just what was being taught. You could have the best teachers in the world. Um, if, if they're a drooling psycho, they're, yeah. not, they're not doing their job. No, and that was one of the things that was important to us along the way is to make sure that we were, that we were changing the scene in a really positive way way like the bare minimum had to to be to be raised but on that on that note of uh, finding the right places to train because we have to wind it up um so gym name web address location rise mma i'll turn north uh rise mma.com.au um jits and muay thai yep jits and muay thai kids uh jits from ages four Kids Muay Thai from ages five all the way up to death. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they got morbid really quickly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Dave, like, where's your gym? What's the uh, the URL? We'll we'll put the links in the description as well so people awesome, can find it. Awesome, awesome. So it's uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu Temple Stow, one four three A Parker Street uh, in Temple Stow. Uh, Gracie hyphen Jiu Jitsu dot com dot au. And we have uh, the Bullyproof program. So with Little Champs, starting at sort of four or five and then graduating all the way through to uh, the, the Master Cycle. We have the Women Empowered, Combatives, all that awesome. sort of stuff that's running. And we, we do extra stuff as well. Um, so I'm sort of in a bit of a unique position mm-hmm. um, because I have the, the Gracie Academy stuff, but also the Pedro Sauer stuff. Mm-hmm. So we're... We sort of sit very that's cool very interestingly in that position so yeah come to class so Have guys fun. if you're in the areas go and check them out um can't go wrong um on that note uh make sure you keep training guys and we'll see you for the next one and we won't have to cry.